Rather, if you're leaving, it's not like this. How do I know when it starts? Uh, that green light right there, sir. We're oh, great. We all set? All set. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Comptroller's Work Group on Pandemic Spending. This is the seventh meeting, I believe. Today, this work group continues its mission to fulfill its legislative mandate of oversight and accounting for the billions of dollars of taxpayer money that have been expended over the last year and a half in Maryland. I believe it's both morally and fiscally prudent that we continue to evaluate these transactions to guard against waste, fraud, and pandemic profiteering. I'm very excited for today's meeting as we will discuss pandemic relief do dollars spent on education, one of our favorite subjects. I'm very pleased to welcome everyone who's going to uh, give us testimony today. It's my hope that today's presentations will provide perspectives on those who have been at the front lines, not only battling a pandemic, but also going above and beyond to fulfill their duty to educate Maryland students. Educators and support staff have been among the, the unsung heroes of this pandemic and the personal and professional lives of, the, of thousands of Marylanders in this profession have been turned upside down. And I just wanna thank their representatives for being here uh, to give us insight. As schools swiftly transitioned to virtual schooling at the start of the pandemic, back to in-person with significant challenges due to the ongoing pandemic. The challenges posed by the pandemic on our schools continues to be evident today with record high vacancies in teaching and support staff positions and significant learning loss that our students have experienced over the past two years. I just want to say that the rank and file teachers are the true heroes of this. They're exhausted. They're burnt out. The substitute teachers that normally are there are not there for whatever reason because of the pandemic. It really is something that uh, it deserves the attention of the state because we value and appreciate our teachers and uh, I know that better compensation, better attention is being paid, better safety practices, et cetera. I'm all for that. But we also need to do the little things to make sure that our retired teachers who often come back as substitute teachers feel safe. And I think that's one of the issues right now, just not only for the school system, but also for the whole state's economy. So I continue to be a fan of uh, when we get back to normal at BWI Airport and, uh, you know, at the, when we're announced that our flight is ready for boarding and would the veterans please stand up and go first because we applaud them and everybody claps and uh, we recognize and show that we value our veterans. I'd like the next group to be teachers. Any teachers? Any educators? Please get on the plane first, because what you've gone through is, you know, just really uh, amazing. And uh, I'm, I think we want to give them a little bit of attention and show them that in, in addition to everything else, uh, we really value what they have gone through. So I welcome the stakeholders today in our public education system. I'm looking forward to hearing from them on their experiences over the past two years and get a sense of when and where and how the billions of dollars in federal, state, and local aid to education was spent. We're looking for best practices. We're looking for lessons learned. We're looking for, God help us, we hope we never have another pandemic, but what is it that we could do uh, better based upon previous experience? Just like every work group meeting, this, this meeting is open to the public, both by live stream and in person, so that Marylanders can personally witness how their money's been spent. We're first gonna receive a presentation from a dear friend that I date back many years with, Dr. Mike, Dr. Michael 
Martirano, Superintendent of Howard County Public Schools. Following Dr. Martirano, we will hear the perspective from my home county, Montgomery County, by Mr. Robert Riley, Associate Superintendent of Finance. Once the counties have completed their presentations, the Maryland State Department of Education will provide an overview on how the state is allocated and administered pandemic relief. And then presenting uh, for the MSD staff will be Ms. Ari Americaner, Chief of Staff. And why do you listen to her? Because she's sharp as a tack, I'm telling you. She's going to be terrific and uh, she does a big, very important job for the State Department of Education, <laughs> as well as Mr. Justin uh, De Deboff, Assistant Superintendent of Financial Planning, and Krishna Ta Talur, Deputy State Superintendent for Operations. Finally, we'll hear firsthand accounts of how effective the pandemic relief was for teachers in the classroom every day. Uh, Ms. Sam Zwerdling will present on behalf of the Maryland State Education Association, and Mr. Nathan Farrell, will represent the Baltimore Teachers Unions. Thank you all for attending. And with that, uh, Mike, please begin your presentation. Thank you for your service to the state of Maryland. Thank you, Comptroller. It is uh, great to see you and I will echo your words. Uh, I've known you for a long time and you have been a consistent uh, supporter of public education in the state of Maryland. And for that, I thank you uh, for all that you do as well. So thank you for having us today. And to everyone who's here, and I know that we're being live streamed, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Michael Martirano, the proud superintendent of the Howard County Public School System. And Comptroller, we're going to tell you about our numbers today, but through a story. Uh, as you've eloquently said in your opening comments, uh, as you were conveying the support for our staff, we're not going to just talk about the numbers, but we're going to talk about the stories behind those numbers as well. So I'm going to move through this uh, in a very quick period of time and allow opportunities for questions. Joining me today is Jahan Tab Siddiqui, my chief administrative officer for the school system. Again, thank you for extending this opportunity to speak about our efforts to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic while leveraging the critical grant funding to receive to be received. We begin to head back to the start of the pandemic. And let me take you on that journey. In March of 2020, let's take us back to that moment two years ago. The news that we had been following regarding the spread of the new coronavirus around the world was finally impacting our communities in Maryland. As the virus was spreading, so was fear and questions. Days before the closing of our school buildings by the state superintendent of schools on March 13th, 2020, my leadership team led a comprehensive tabletop exercise in partnership with several county agencies to prepare for the possibility that schools may be closed and identify the significant challenge that we faced. It was clear, Comptroller, that we needed to quickly overcome sem several monumental challenges. The two top being the continuation of instruction and providing the supplemental supports that schools provide to so many of our families. Soon after that exercise, we received word that school buildings would indeed close, initially for what we thought to be two weeks, then a month, then through the end of the school year. While we had already begun the, on our work in the anticipation of this decision, the immediate implementation required an expedited response. The challenge before every educator in the state was how to best provide continued instruction in a virtual environment. For Howard County, this was particularly daunting since technology was going to need to be the bridge between students and teachers. However, like many districts in the state of Maryland, our district did not have enough computers for students so that every student had a device. In fact, Comptroller, we only had 15,000 available devices for more than our 58,000 students, and that is a critical piece. This meant we needed the immediate, the immediate interim instruction solutions, which consisted, consisted of printed packets, developed and issued to our students all, across all levels. We expedited every effort to purchase enough Chromebooks to supplement our stock and ensure every student and staff member were able to have a device at home. We were also developing solutions for many households in the county who were without internet access and the hundreds of homeless students that we serve. Equally important, we had to account for the fact that our schools serve as much more than the instructional institutions. Many students and families rely on schools for balanced meals, social emotional supports, health services, and other supports that we're extremely fearful that we would go without. 
As we sought solutions to overcome these challenges, we had two primary factors limiting our response. The time to develop and implement those solutions. We were under that time crunch. The funding to properly serve nearly 59,000 students and 9,000 full and part-time staff. The upcoming summer months provided an additional time needed to develop and implement an entirely virtual instructional model and plan for providing students with the supplemental supports and resources they needed to, to thrive. Financially, we immediately put in place the budget measures to begin generating the fiscal capacity to purchase Chromebooks, the PPE, meals, and other immediate response items. This became an urgent fiscal priority that was impacted by other fiscal realities that existed, namely a significant deficit in our health fund that was inherited by my administration that handcuffed many of the things we were able to do. Even without those constraints, Comptroller, I don't believe there was a district in the state ready and able to implement everything that was required at that time. Fortunately, the federal government took quick action to send relief funds. These federal grants have been a critical resource that we have leveraged to respond quickly, to get technology to students and implement necessary public health and safety measures. I am extremely proud of the way our district responded during the pandemic, focusing first on the needs of our students and staff. An impactful indicator of the grant funding being used to serve the needs of students is the fact that over 11 million meals have been, were served in our district since the start of the pandemic, and I'm very proud of that. As of January 31st, 2022, our district has been awarded 19 grants totaling 1 million, 101.6 million in COVID-19 relief funds. Total expenditures for all relief grants to date is 36.1 million. These funds have empowered our district to provide the supports necessary for students and staff without having to eliminate priorities that are funded as part of our annual operating budget. Each of the grants received address critical needs that have arisen because of the pandemic. I could talk about each of them individually, but let me highlight three grants that have been absolutely crucial to our success. These are the Elementary Secondary School Emergency Relief Funds, referred to as ESSER. The largest of these federal grants will provide funding into 2024, which is especially important because we recognize that the academic recovery in acceleration will take multiple years. The COVID-19 pandemic has now impacted three school years where our students have had to contend with closures, virtual instruction, quarantining, safety protocols, and many other changes that have prevented a return to pre-pandemic normalized instruction. The initial ESSER one grant was used to pay for the cost of 10,805 Chromebooks that were purchased at the onset of the pandemic. Immediately, this put our district on the path from one where not all students and staff had a device issued by the school system to now, sir, being a fully one-to-one -one district. And again, very proud of that effort. As we were preparing for a model that was looking likely to be a fully virtual for an extended period of time, this first step was monumental to our success. By securing the minimal technology needed to provide virtual instruction, staff were able to focus their energy on developing the best way to deliver instruction in a way that had never, ever been done in Howard County on such a large scale. Without the availability of ESSER One funds, we would have had to identify over 4 million in savings to pull from other areas in our operating budget. That's the equivalent of more than 60 new teaching positions. Additional relief funds and support from our county relief funds allow for the purchase of enough Chromebooks to achieve one-to-one -one technology for the 2020-2021 school year. In the beginning of 2021, ESSER II funds became available and we were able to enhance supporting efforts for students and staff to address learning loss through enhanced tutoring, summer school, and extended school year instructional capacity. So this includes assessment and services to meet IEP and Section uh, 504 plans to continue providing tutoring supports begun in the CARES Tutoring Grant. Taking a quick look at the 2021 summer school session provides an example of the types of impact these programs are having for our students. We provided instructional access and enrichment opportunities to approximately 6,240 students from pre-K through 12 
representing an increase in enrollment of approximately 63.5% from the 2020 uh, summer session. The increased enrollment can be attributed to offering both in-person and virtual program options, removing fees for high school credit recovery, adding additional programming, and expanding student support options through academic intervention. A powerful indicator of the success of the academic intervention program is approximately nine in 10 students, or over 90%, maintained or improved their being a reader, better known as BAR, set levels from the end of the school year to the end of the summer program. We measured their success. Additionally, our innovative pathways program for high school students resulted in students recovering 422 total credits and earning 456 original full credits and 139 half credits. We understood even before the virtual instructional model was cultivated and implemented that it would not be able to serve all students the way that in-person does. Many students would need more. And our greatest concern, sir, was students falling through the cracks. We had to find ways to serve them as the same or similar levels, but in different ways. We quickly found that tutoring, extended school day opportunities, in summer school were effective offerings to help individual students who were not having the same success virtually that they had in person. And I'm proud to report that we anticipate having approximately 6,000 students participating in summer programs again this year. Funds were also used to purchase critical software and learning to support these efforts such as LexiAccord, which focuses on reading, Dreambox, which focuses on math, active learning, and Orton-Gillingham training. Providing special education services was another area that caused us great concern, and ESSER $2 provided us with the added flexibility to make the adjustments in IEP and 504s to account for new realities while continuing to provide FAPE, which is obviously free and appropriate public education. Finally, sir, ESSER 3 is the largest grant received yet. The funds from this grant will be used to enhance student supports, in safe school operations as we aim to provide the wraparound support students require and maintain healthy instructional environments for the long term. In the coming months and year, we will understand with more clarity the impact this pandemic has had on our students as learners and on their social emotional well-being, a major concern. It is critical that we implement solutions and secure the required funding that allows us to be flexible as, the, as needs evolve. While we are extremely supportive of enhancing our digital learning offering, fully in-person instruction needs to be the default instructional models and schools should be the last places in the community to close. By with that expectation comes the requirement to ensure our buildings and classrooms remain healthy and safe environments. Many of our SO3 funds have been leveraged to secure necessary personal protective equipment or better known as PPE. To maintain healthy instructional and work environments, masks, plexiglass, enhanced surface cleaning materials, MERV filters, and HEPA filters are several of the strategies employed to maintain healthy instructional spaces. In addition, working with our county government, we were able to use some of the funding to provide one-time bonuses to our staff in recognition of their commitment to our students to adapting quickly during these challenging times. And that was a total of 16 million used with our county dollars and our school system dollars that's resulted in an $1,800 bonus for our staff across the board. In order to take care of our children well, we must take care of our staff who take care of them. We will need to continue to ensure that we retain and continue to recruit the high quality teachers and staff members to ensure our students are receiving the best instruction and support services. Mr. Comptroller, we have certainly come a long way from the initial tabletop exercise conducted before the school building's closures occurred. Anticipating the impact of COVID-19 virus and the necessary response was an impossible exercise. The best we could do was prepare for as best we could for the plethora of unknowns and be ready for the constantly turn on a dime. The needs of our students, staff, and families were many, which created numerous requirements on local school systems. We serve as so much more than instructional delivery institutions. We provide a wraparound services that students and families rely on to thrive and to simply make it through each day. So many of, our, of the services provided by our schools will never be found on measurable data and reports, but they are essential nonetheless. 
Our compassionate and student-centered staff provide meals and other supports to hundreds of homeless students and thousands of students living in poverty who depend on school meals possibly being their only nutritional meal of the day. Our staff serve as trusted adults that students approach with personal challenges, and too many of our students carry unnecessary and unfortunate burdens on their backs, and schools often serves as the reprieve from that reality. Not a single dollar of federal, state, or local funding was used to purchase care, compassion, love, and the other for wonderful traits that our staff exhibit every day and that every student requires. However, sir, the critical funding we received created the necessary environments and opportunities so that those acts of care and compassion of love could occur. I want to conclude by expressing my appreciation for the support that the Howard County Schools have received through the distribution of grant funding. Without it, our response to the pandemic would look much different. And I can certainly say it would have been a far less effective. As we look beyond today, we face many new realities as a result of the pandemic. Never will we simply be able to go back in, to the way things were. And in many ways, there are some positives from this experience. We have found different ways to offer instruction and support that reach more people than, than there, there are. The importance of social workers and other critical support staff have become a staple in schools and something we can't roll back to pre-pandemic levels. The extended instructional support offering beyond the school day have played a crucial role in the academic success of many students. And as we look beyond the grant funding as it expires, we, we must have critical conversations at the state level on how Maryland can continue to be a leader in providing high quality instruction and care for students. The implementation of the blueprint for Maryland future over the next 10 years will be informed by the lessons learned during the pandemic. And as the Howard County Public School System's definition of equity notes, this includes providing the access, opportunities, and support to help students, families, and staff reach their fullest potential by removing all the barriers to success that individuals face. Mr. Comptroller, again, thank you for the support that has been provided throughout the course of the pandemic. The support of the state has been instrumental in our efforts and the impact of the funding received and has been substantial for our students, staff, and family. I really appreciate the, oppor the opportunity today to share our experience. Thank you very much, sir. Please, we have a few questions. <clears throat> Brilliant, great testimony, exactly what we were looking for. What was the application process for the supplemental grants like? Is that something that is uh, that uh, you competed with other jurisdictions for, or were, was it simply allocated to you? So there was a clearly defined process, and I'm going to ask Mr. Siddiqui to provide some granular information about that. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, committee members. Um, most of the grant funding applications were based, uh, the allocations were based on our Title I funding um, allocation, so we knew that we had a defined amount. However, the federal legislation did have some requirements related to uh, learning recovery, PPE, and some other items. So we did, so each school system did have to articulate uh, to MSD in its application. While we were guaranteed that level of funding, we still needed to articulate how we a budget on how we would be using uh, using that funding. There were some competitive grants uh, that were part of that, but if you're looking at the overall grant picture, most of the grants were allocated based on uh, our student population and needs. Great. And what happened to all the Chromebooks? Are they just uh, allocated to the families? And uh... so the main topic for us prior to the pandemic was getting to one-to-one, -to -one, shifting with the future of the instructional delivery models for the state of Maryland, being very forward thinking. The operating budget at the time prior to the pandemic did not allow that to move as swiftly as I'd like. So we took full advantage of the opportunities of the funding available uh, for, our, for our students to provide the necessary one-to-one -one computers. And now we are still using that in our school system to retain, taking the lessons learned, the best instructional models of which we had to advance that for the future. So they remain. Uh, we are developing our own policies and procedures regarding replacement, but our commitment to now to the future of our students based upon the technology has been supported by the funding provided, and that will lead us into the future as well. So we will retain those Chromebooks and build for the future on that success. Superintendent, I assume this uh, question will be easily answered by you, but Communicating with parent groups and the unions, I've always found that having everybody together to converse about something like a crisis that you went through 
sometimes produces a better result than just, you know, orders coming down from on top. How did, how did you communicate with the various stakeholders? Thank you for that question, sir. And you've known me for a long time. And those who've saw me present today, I have no problem communicating. And we communicate often and regularly with our stakeholders. We have a wonderful working relationship with our union, HCEA, uh, with our president, Colleen Morris, who we speak constantly uh, about these topics. We developed an MOU, uh, Memorandum of Understanding, for our educators uh, during this time of the pandemic because it was a different model. We had to be extremely sensitive to the concerns of our teachers, communicate often and regular uh, with our parents, using the Board of Education meetings as an opportunity to present information out to our community and sending information out in a variety of different fashions uh, to all of our parents and families. They were partners and for an understanding, sir, it was a very stressful time for our families. Many were in fear, many of individuals suffering in silence. And when I talk about the service of providing 11 million meals, when you think of Howard County, 23% of our students qualify for free and reduced meals. And I communicated that regularly with our Board of Education to take care of the individuals who were really struggling during the pandemic. So communication was tantamount to our success uh, moving through it with that partnership, sir. And then you <laughs> mentioned the mental health uh, aspects. So I assume the wraparound services that have you had to innovate uh, and produce and pay for, I assume that they and whatever mental health innovations you've introduced uh, are going to, you're going to want to continue those past the pandemic. <coughs> Absolutely. The operating budget, which we presented to the county executive contains a great portion of dollars to support our counselors, our pupil personnel workers, our psychologists, our social workers, building grant funding uh, with our local partnerships to really provide that support. Individuals who have been providing that support have been crucial and critical to the success of our students because many of our students and families, as I've stated, have been truly suffering in silence and the social emotional well-being of our students has to be taken care of first before we can really get to the business of instruction. So our whole model of shifting of how we view education in Howard County has really shifted around taking care of our students first, the needs of the students, so that, that quality instruction can occur. And we are extremely committed to the supports and will leverage every dollar that we can to provide the supports of, of the social emotional well-being of our students. I think we'd love to get some kind of summary of that so that every county is aware of what you're doing in Howard and they may be doing other things. But I think that's probably uh, not going to be restricted to the education sector. We're going to see things like this happen in healthcare, for example. Right. And, uh, you know, they're going to be different approaches to some of the uh, responsibilities that each sector has, transportation, et cetera. So yes, sir. if you could help us with what Howard County's doing, is that's terrific. I have the deputy comptroller and would like to ask him if he has any questions. Andy Shoffel. Thank you, sir. Just one question. Thank you for the presentation. Excellent presentation. Um, this is sort of uh, somewhat philosophical. I think your presentation covered everything. Comptroller touched on, you know, you had to hire a bunch of social workers. Right. And uh, you have plenty of money, but that doesn't mean that everything you needed was then available, no matter how much money you kind of throw at it. So, um, you know, what do you wish you had more access to in a world kind of without barriers? What would you have done? Uh, well, the, the, you know, if I had to do, I mean, we, we've gone through an exercise of lessons learned. Uh, the emotional impact on our staff was great. And when we talk about the great resignation uh, across America, that we were not exempt from that in Howard County. So continuing to provide the scaffold supports of our nurses, first and foremost, who are the ones who are leading the way by providing the immunizations and the vaccinations, allaying the fear and concern of our staff was critical. And we are, we're working very hard, sir, to get a, a nurse and assistant in every one of our schools in Howard County. So as I think in the future of long-term funding allocations, it should be a goal in the state of Maryland for every school to have a nurse and assistant because they were crucial in that support. Also going back and providing the support was you were just talking about guidance counselors and we'll provide that modeling for you, but meeting the basic standards of requirement of the ratios set by the national organizations for counselors. If every school in the state of Maryland achieved that ratio, we would be head and shoulders of all of our peers across the nation. So those are two tangibles that we're striving hard 
to meet. But then the, the problem can, is, is availability, supply and demand. So we have positions available. We allocated additional dollars for nurses, but then it's a shortage, right? So we're experiencing that same level of shortage and then resignation and trying to find qualified individuals has really had to ramp up uh, our uh, opportunities to recruit and retain those individuals. So we're in that process now being very forward thinking with how do we get ahead of that curve for the upcoming school year? See, it never ends for us. I have to always think two budget cycles down the road and staying in line with that. So that becomes a major issue of one, allocating the positions and having the money is one thing, but having the availability of staff and the individuals lined up to take those positions is another issue. But we are heavily focused on doing those things that are necessary for the emotional well-being of our students and our staff. We have to take care of our staff as well. And we've added additionally, let me add this moment, I went back and re-examined our academic calendar and we're dictated by minutes and hours we were able to find some time where I'm now providing a day of wellness, a half day of wellness for our staff every month. And it's a, a day where we want them to be able to do whatever they want to relieve that pressure with the philosophy, we have to take care of ourselves before we can take care of others. And we communicated heavily, sir, with our parents about that so that they understood and they embraced that because we really wrap around and support our teachers. I think we need to do that for, uh the comptroller's office too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Sandy saying, yeah. I hope I answered your question. You did, thank you. Absolutely, yes, thank you, sir. Um, you mentioned in your presentation about learning loss. And yes. so when you look at just, actually just in March, there was a um, article that just came out about standardized testing showing that students are being, have been impacted by the pandemic in, in spite of the summer schools, in spite of all of the other things that you've put in place. What are some of Howard County's plans and or is there anything the state can do to help in terms of help bridging that learning loss gap? Well, and, and we have a wonderful partnership with MSDE and I recognize that they will be presenting here as well. And we meet as a group of superintendents. The beautiful thing about the state of Maryland, we may be small in size, but we're mighty in our approach and our collaboration. We meet regularly uh, once a month with all the superintendents. And I've been a part of that group for a number of years and we share best practices. So when we start talking about the first thing is acknowledging, the first step to recovery is acknowledging that you have a problem, right? So we've got to acknowledge where our data points are. If you look for my presentation, I talked about using an assessment at the end of last academic year of the performance of our students in, in summer school. And then at the end of that, benchmarking that to see if we had marked levels of success. But we're seeing those regression of skills in all across our academics. At the same time, our graduation rate has gone to a very high level of 94%. We're very proud of that. But yet 6% of our students still aren't making it. So our wraparound services, our summer interventions, our opportunities to restructure our academic day by providing tutoring opportunities and intervening in a timely fashion when we know students are failing. We all want our students to be successful. We all can measure what the results are, but how do we intervene during the school year to ensure that that success is happening right then and there. So teachers, once again, adjusting their academic schedule to go back and reteach so that students can have that mastery of concepts, not just socially promoting students, but ensuring they have met the requisite skills to ensure that those standards at the grade level have been achieved. So it's a multi-pronged approach. And we're in the process in Howard County of establishing a very clearly articulated plan from birth through 12th grade and beyond that talks about those marker moments that we wanna dip in and measure, but also on those formative assessments throughout the academic year that measure success. And again, but where does that all take place is in the classroom. So we've gotta to continue to provide the supports to our teachers to allow that delivery model that I've talked about to occur. I think as I listen to you, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, these test scores, you know, your teachers are your leaders in your classroom. Right? Correct. And if in these test scores, if you don't have engaged teachers, I think you're going to continue to see these declining test scores. So it's nice to see that you're investing in the teachers the way you are, especially that have, half day of wellness will go a huge long. And it's it's the first, as Martin Luther King talks about, it's the fierce urgency of now. We can't wait just for summer recovery. We can't wait for the end of a final exam. 
we have to be benchmarking and looking at our students' successes daily to ensure that mastery of content is, a ha is happening regularly and provide the supports there. I mean, and there's a whole series of instructional interventions. And looking at that continuum of our students' abilities to continue to accelerate so that AP courses are offered, dual enrollment is offered. And then as I talked about our students with disabilities, uh, that it, to ensure that the IEP is being delivered with fidelity uh, so that FAPE is occurring, working heavily with our parent community and our special education community. It's an it's a, it's a incredibly demanding amount of work right now, but the future of our state is predicated on the fact of the success of, of what we're talking about here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris Riley is head of our compliance, our biggest division, and uh, usually has the sharpest questions. <laughs> That's why I've got backup. <laughs> and I was about right to say, I don't have any questions for you, but I obviously have to have some for now. Um, thank you all for the, for, for the presentation. My wife works in the public school system herself, and so she doesn't happen to work in any of the uh, counties that are presented here, but, but not, nonetheless. So a lot of this strikes, strikes home to me. Right. Very, very, very close. Um, with the understanding that you had $101 million roughly that, that, right. you, that you were, were working with and understanding that there is also a process by which you would get those funds. Uh, and I know that nothing, you know, give me an idea of that when it came to you though. I, I mean, because there was an immediate need, right? I mean, so that, so that's, that's March of 2020. Well, let, let me, let me I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'll just say, just give me an idea roughly. Well, early on, I mean, I, I, when I think back to those days, we have to be reflective on those lessons learned to understand how we move forward. We knew money was going to be allocated, right? We planned based upon that allocation. We began our work defining our needs. We were looking at other alternative funding sources using our own fund balance to because we to, in order to advance during the pandemic, we had to have that infrastructure of technology. That was a must, a non-negotiable. We didn't have those funds available, but we were planning for the release of those. We were also looking at our own internal ways of how we could uh, adjust our current dollars and our operating budget to have that happen. So all of that was in motion at the same time so that when those dollars did become available uh, from the federal government, we were able to shift that amount. I think as I think to MSDE and having to submit our plans, we've shifted that plan so many different times back and forth. And I encourage that that it shouldn't be static, that we should have the flexibility of the fluidity of those changing demands and expectations. Every time I talked to Mr. Siddiqui, I had a different way of which I wanted to approach that, which required an adjustment to our plan. That flexibility needs to be allowed so that you can respond to the demands of which you have within the needs of your school system. So although there was a process, we didn't allow that process to stymie what the needs were to advance because I was so focused on getting the Chromebooks in the hands and the internet connectivity and bridging the gap for our students who didn't have access. Uh, it was a whole process that was a non-negotiable and we were bound and determined to use our either our local dollars uh, to provide that support and then fortunately with the grants that allowed for that to happen. So I never felt that uh, distraction of timeliness because we had a need to be met and the flexibility allowed for the adjustment of our plan also supported that. And I, and, and I do, I, and I appreciate the fact that you, you were flexible, but the question, can you give me an idea when you got the funds though? Yes, sir. If you just give me a ballpark. That's so I don't have the exact dates uh, necessarily, but I can tell you the first two weeks of the pandemic when we were closed, um, it was more looking at our own budget to identify $4 million um, in potential budget adjustments that we could use to purchase those Chromebooks because we had to take that to the board and we had to tell the board where the money was going to come from. At that point, we didn't really have any sense of what the ESSER funding was going to look like. As soon as the federal government, as soon as Congress approved each tranche of the legislation that they did, the CARES Act, uh, the, the second relief, uh, the, then the ARP, um, we would start to look at what those estimates were for Howard County um, and then uh, would work with MSDE. MSDE typically would share preliminary estimates of what each local district's allocation was going to be. Uh, and then there were oftentimes DLS was doing the same kind of work. So uh, there would sometimes be times where I'd get a DLS report before I'd get an MSDE report, but we would have read the legislation and come up with our own estimate at that time too. So we always had an idea of what the legislation was saying. We were following along with it. The other challenge for us early on that we recognized was uh, in my role, 
um, I uh, brought together uh, three or four of my counterparts from some other school districts. And we had, uh, I think at that point, we started uh, having a conversation every Tuesday and Thursday by, by teleconference. Uh, and then slowly that group turned into all of the CFOs from all of the school districts. And then somebody said, let's have MSD in there. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's have MSD in there. Then let's, we had uh, Mary Pat Fannin from, uh, um, from uh, Pazam uh, join us as well. And then we had John Willems from Mabe join us as well. Those calls have now, they went from two days a week to uh, one uh, once a week to uh, once every uh, two weeks. And now they're, they are a standing CFO meeting uh, that happens every two weeks. Uh, MSDE uh, coordinates those meetings now. And so we've got that information flow going on on a very regular basis. And that, that's really helpful in understanding what's coming so that we can start to plan. We don't necessarily wait until we actually get the grant award or we've gotten the grant application because as I stated earlier, with most of these grants, we already know what we're entitled to be or what, what's allocated for our districts. It's really just a matter of us being able to articulate on paper and the state having the time to be able to review it, certify it, and then disperse the funds. And even the disbursement of the funds has been extremely timely where it hasn't presented any cash flow issues for us. And I'm sure my uh, counterparts from Montgomery County would agree with that. That's, that's fine. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Mr. Thank you very much. Mr. Hildebrand, who is our risk uh, management expert. Thank you very much, Mr. Comptroller. Thank you very much for the presentation. Do have a couple of questions. Out of the 101.6 million in grants, how much of that was targeted, meaning you were told this is how this will be spent, and how much was left to your discretion to then go to the schools? So um, out of, uh, I, I can give you the amount. Really, it's it's really an ESSER three, which was our, our total allocation was $43 million. Out of that, uh, approximately nine had to be spent on uh, learning recovery, loss of learning to address those things. Uh, the remaining funding was really uh, left up to local districts to be able to articulate how we wanted to spend it. While we had different buckets, uh, you know, student supports, technology, uh, internet access, those type of things, uh, the actual allocation within that was really left up to the districts uh, to determine. And that that's what's given us that flexibility as the pandemic has continued to evolve and change and the technologies have changed. Uh, you know, uh, prior to last August, nobody was talking about HEPA filters and MERV-13 and those type of things. And all of a sudden the, that those conversations changed. And in those moments, it was really helpful to be able to have that uh, flexibility, as Dr. Martirano stated, to be able to come back and go, hey, we've got to shift some things within the grant uh, and then amend that application. I, I, I've lost track of the number of times we've, we've had to amend our uh, application with the state. As, as long as the uses meet uh, the defined guidelines in the legislation and in the regulations from USDE, uh, we've been able to adjust those and uh, to meet our needs. Yeah, Thank you. Can I add something sure. as well? The, the, the advocacy, if, if I leave you with no other message today, uh, is the advocacy for the flexibility with those local funds to be able to make the decisions in a timely fashion. I recognize the requirements set by the, the feds and the state in terms of allocation of dollars, but where the rubber meets the road, we need to be able to have that flexibility. And I jokingly say internally, I sp I've spent those dollars 25 different ways from the, where we were at the inception to where we are. And having that flexibility is critical because each one of our counties may have similar needs, but they're very different and unique, and we have to take that into account. Thank you. Um, just follow up with any of that money. Uh, and you were talking about needing nurses, the assistants, counselors. Were you able to increase staff? I, I heard you say you have some positions. Yeah. So so the, I think the other message which I want to say, we've had to be very judicious, and I've shared this with my colleagues. We can't set up a system where when those dollars then end, that we set a funding cliff, right? We have to be financially solid stewards and be responsible in our spending. So in, in the way of which we've added staff, for example, the nurses, we've made adjustments on a temporary basis to respond to the need. And then I've made a case to preserve that in the operating budget. You can't put yourself in a position with all these influx of dollars and say, hey, why can't we do? Why can't we do? And then in three years, we have a crisis on our hand. That's another message that we need to convey to everyone. It has a time stamp, time bound amount, and then making priorities at the local level to preserve those in the operating budget and capital budget if it requires any of that as well. But one last question. With when this kind of money all comes in, it all comes in with overhead. You have to deal with not just money. How are you going to spend it? How did you all handle that with the increased overhead, the challenges on your staff? Can you tell me Ooh, briefly uh, about that? 
do you have how much time do we have um, we can certainly talk later because i yeah, do no. want to hear and i'll be asking a similar question but yeah. i'm going to go back to the, the to the comptroller's acknowledgement how tough this has been on staff there was not an infusion of people waiting outside of my door to come in and help us with that we were working 24 7 our teachers our staff my budget staff to make all of this happen without the addition let me say that without the addition of additional staff to have that happen, to make certain that everything else was being tended to while we were reshifting and redefining the educational delivery model and the additional requirements on my budget staff, which is, I will make a case, probably the leanest budget staff in the state of Maryland. I'll make a plug for that. We can have a competition later to see. <laughs> so I, I can certainly add that's been a lot of overnights and weekends to be able to meet the reporting requirements, to be able to watch the grant funding going in and out, to be able to ensure that every division, every office is is uh, spending um, and recording expenditures uh, accurately. We put in place a system early on where every expenditure related to the pandemic has to go through multiple approvals and I sign off on everything. So I'm at a point where uh, I still sign off on um, all of the COVID-19 expenditures that will hit the grant so that we can make sure that we're tracking those costs effectively and we're not overspending on the operating side. We are looking at, and we put put this in our um, SR2 and three applications, um, at adding some additional staff and recognizing that these, this grant funding is gonna continue through 2024. We've only uh, spent about a third of it so far. And these reporting requirements do kick in over these next two, three years as well. So it's going to require additional work. So we do have some um, staffing built into the grants itself. But even with those staffing, and this goes back to the previous question of adding social workers and other positions, we've had to look um, uh, several years out to be able to go, if we added five social workers, for example, in year one, which would be this year, how can we phase them out of the grant and shift them to the operating budget as our enrollment Prop, uh, probably fluctuates uh, during those years. So maybe shifting one or two each year to back to the operating budget. So we've had to do the same thing where we held off on hiring these budget and accounting and finance positions um, uh, until we had a better idea of, uh, of what we could manage. And then now we're in the process of filling some of those positions. Thank you very much. Mr. Stu Superintendent, thank you. And Mr. Siddiqui, thank you very much. It's really up and beyond the call of duty. You guys have presented something that I think will be very valuable to us. We appreciate it. And uh, thank you. We're going to now hear from Mr. Robert Riley, Assistant Superintendent of Finance for Montgomery County Public Schools. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Jeannie Dawson, and I am the Chief of Finance and Operations for Montgomery County Public Schools. I am with um, Robert Riley, our Associate Superintendent of Finance, and we did uh, also bring along uh, Yvonne Alwinza, uh, Alfonso Windsor, who is our Budget Specialist. Thank you. And we are so excited to be here today, Comptroller. Well, good. Thank you. We're excited to have you and welcome and please make your presentation. Thank you. So uh, we wanted to start off with just, again, really talking about who is Montgomery County Public Schools and uh, because this had a lot to do with the, the pandemic and the influence of the pandemic and how we approach that work. So when we look at our numbers, uh, this year we had 158 1,232 students. We have 209 schools. Next year, we'll be starting with 210. We have 135 elementaries, 40 middle, 26 high schools. We also have 115 different languages spoken in our school system. Uh, we also have uh, buses that run multiple times around the world uh, a day. So it's um, quite a big system. And we have a, uh, just about a 35% free and reduced farms population. One of the things we want to highlight is um, how we focus when we look at our priorities and the budget really is the MCPS priorities in numbers. Uh, we start with our culture of our respect, relationships, equity, excellence, and learning. And those are the foundational core principles around our top priorities of academic excellence, 
as well as well-being and equity and our professional and operational excellence. Those are our, our priorities that we focus everything around. What we also do in terms of our strategic plan, because our goal is for all students to be prepared for college, career, and community, is we use a um, initiatives implementation. And this is important because as we look at the different areas the pandemic has influenced, um, we recognize that our work is over multiple years. So we actually, um, have different committees and different uh, focus around mitigation of learning disruption and access uh, to schools, our focus on poverty and the most poverty impacted schools, our well being and support for students and staff, our COVID 19 operations advisory committee, which has helped us to manage in particular this year. Uh, especially, and our outreach with our stakeholder groups, and then finally our digital learning and supports. I just want to supply some more background here. So um, as you can see, and I got to say, it, it's hard to follow another school district because a lot of the things that we went through were very similar to what Howard went through as well too, as well as our budget. So we're looking here at our revenues. Um, and as you can see, 93% of our uh, funding comes from our state um, and our local funding sources. Um, federal, which represents our Title I dollars, represents 3%. But the reason we put this slide up here is because with ESSER, uh, that actually equates to about 14% of our budget now if we look at our ESSER funding compared to our FY22 budget. Uh, we also wanted to show our expenditures, our, our $2.8 billion budget. Uh, most of it, 94% uh, is, is school-related and instruction-related. Uh, so we just wanted to put that out there, as well as 90% uh, of our expenditures relate to uh, salaries and wages and benefits. Uh, and again, a little redundant because uh, Howard County went through the same thing, uh, but this was our um, our timeline uh, that we went through during the pandemic. Um, we, we finished up uh, FY20 virtual and we started virtual with a historic decrease in enrollment. I believe all the LEAs, uh, uh, experience a decrease in enrollment in the first year. We actually exp uh, experienced a second decrease in uh, this year as well, too. Uh, we wanted to make sure we uh, noted that we had record enrollment in our 2021 summer school, and we'll speak more about that later. Um, and then 2021-22, with the help of ESSER funding, we were able to uh, begin in-person learning for all students, as well as uh, fronting our uh, Montgomery Virtual Academy. So, as we look at our historic de decreases, in the first year, we, we lost about 4,700 students in September of 2020. In uh, this most recent year, we had a loss of 2,332 students in September of 2021. So in addition to um, you know those historic decreases, because we, over the last really 20 years, we've had enrollment growth of about 2,500 students per year. Um, significant learning loss has been experienced by our students uh, due to uh, the, the impact of the pandemic, as well as what's been discussed previously around social emotional supports that are necessary, and that's for staff and students. The labor shortage uh, was very um, difficult because we had to respond to hard to fill and retain positions around teachers, substitutes, paraeducators, bus operators, um, and leading to negotiating working conditions so that we can show our staff how much we care and also to um, keep morale going. In addition to that, um, some more of the impact was asymptomatic testing we had to put in all 209 schools, and we also had um, rapid testing kits that we've provided to students, masking, and PPE. And when we think about PPE for Montgomery County, we're talking hundreds of thousands of products that are necessary. Uh, in addition to that, purchasing Chromebooks, laptops for all students and teachers for virtual learning. So that did move us to a one-to-one. -one. 
when we consider the um, different areas of uh, federal appropriation, we look at that Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, so our CARES Act funding that came in, in addition to the governor's um, emergency education relief. This was all necessary for us, especially as we were beginning uh, that to fill the technology surge as the, as mo we moved from the virtual component uh, to make sure that we had one-on-one. -on -one. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. In addition to the technology and the tutoring, with the addition of the ESSER II funding and ESSER III funding, uh, and we also uh, have FEMA and MEMA reimbursements uh, based on other uh, funding that was necessary around PPE and emergency aid. So uh, Dr. Dawson had mentioned our uh, budget development process. So we also use that when we develop, uh, when we looked into the uses for ESSER um, using the same groups of stakeholders. Uh, so. ESSER uh, uh, delineated between safe return to schools as well as mitigating learning disruption. And what our groups did was look at specific uh, functional areas that we were gonna look at to um, allocate those funding. So summer school tutoring interventions and enrichments uh, are just, we had eight different areas. And the groups that, that we showed in the, in the uh, first slide, we had a group for COVID-19 uh, operations. We had a group for mitigating learning disruption. We had a group for um, well-being and support. And these are all made up of our various stakeholders, including um, associations, uh, PTA clusters, uh, our black and brown coalition, as well as students too. So everybody kind of had a part in how we were um, looking at how we were going to utilize ESSER funding. Um, and it's, it's a little, might be a little hard to read, but this is how we uh, we did that. So the, there are these are the uh, major categories there that I was talking about. Uh, including digital learning, and those are the ESSER funding areas, and then we allocated ESSER 1, 2, and 3, um, as you see there. So one of the things that's really important is, is to really look through everything through an equity lens, and that is in terms of the decision-making of how money is spent is so critical to really providing that to the most marginalized students and those that have the most needs. So we looked at tutoring and um, these were some of the most important uh, aspects of making sure that we had before and after school, in particular around math and literacy and the one-on-one -on -one support for students in quarantine. So when you think about um, students that have to be out on quarantine, again, that provides even more learning loss. So we then uh, worked collaboratively with our curriculum office, our, um, our direct focus to schools, uh, and our stakeholders to develop ways to provide learning when we came back into school and in-person learning for students that were out on quarantine and were able to provide service to them. That was very, it was innovative, but it was also necessary because we can't um, continue learning loss. So the tuition-free summer school uh, in grades K through 12 was provided last year and is providing again this year. The establishment of our virtual academy, which we'll, we'll highlight shortly. Um, technology for remote and in-person learning. So that even though we are back in person, we still provide that one-on-one. -on -one. We continue to upgrade uh, and continue to provide, as we have new students coming in, um, continuing to provide those services. Uh, our, prof our professional development for mental health and well-being. So, you know, again, you have to help adults to move, you have to move adults to move kids. And that means you have to create a safe environment for them. So also, you know, making sure that, that we have those opportunities to learn and provide professional learning for staff in, in how to support their students and each other. Purchase of social emotional learning curriculum, the leader in me, is something that we rolled out to our schools and has been uh, well received. And again, another aspect of helping students to uh, assimilate better into in-person learning from being out. Uh, purchasing, um, well, actually hiring counselors and social workers, again, um, still a need. 
uh, that is because of the shortages throughout the country in these positions, but we continue to recruit and retain and do major outreach efforts um, through our um, different universities and working directly with our OHRD, our Human Resources and Development. Uh, HVAC and infrastructure modifications, which also includes over 93,000 HEPA filter changes and replacements, um, about 7,900 air filters for schools, all of our um, classrooms have been uh, checked. We do, um, you know, testing of air quality, but all of that was something that we had to really come to terms with under these conditions. Purchase of personal protective equipment and safety materials for staff, students, building, cleaning supplies, water bottle filling stations. We actually have uh, put those into all of our schools because when water fountains um, we're out. We recognize we had to provide bottled water for our students. And then when we were able to bring water fountains back in this year, we uh, also put in filling stations in, in schools. That, that will continue to be an upgrade for us. In terms of just, I'm going to highlight that uh, perfective um, equipment in the PPE. When we first started in March 2020, Remember, you could not get certain um, aspects of hand sanitizer or uh, to the, the amount that you needed. Uh, I don't know if you recall, even uh, Santa wipes were, were of short supply there for a while. Luckily, we had forethought in um, the fall of 2019 in making sure and ensuring that we have products so that when it hit, we had the products and then we continued to use and I will highlight our procurement office because the procurement office had to consistently procure materials throughout the country in order to get the numbers, the massive numbers that we need for 159,000 students, 158,000 students and 25,000 employees. It is uh, a daunting task, but procurement is, is a partner in this and a very important one. So summer school, um, here's some of our successes, and I'm not sure, I apologize for the titles not being on there, um, but summer school for 2021, we served over 53,000 students. That was basically doubling our past numbers of, of about 25,000 students per summer school. And um, this was to accelerate learning recovery and support our most vulnerable students. We needed to have our students come and our teachers, again, worked through the summer in order to support this. And our most vulnerable students offering um, the, the EYP programs and, and other programs all wrapped into that. We offered it um, throughout all of our schools, and we did have a virtual component to that. Our virtual academy has enrolled over 3,000 students all year long. Uh, this is something that we see as a success that we will maintain and continue uh, because it is offered uh, options for students. And uh, this has been one of those really aha moments and how successful this can be for students. Uh, focusing on mental health and social emotional wellness through the addition of our wellness rooms. We have wellness rooms that we've put in our schools. They're not in all 209 yet, but you know, by the end of next year or through next year, we will. It's part of our new operating budget as well, but we continue to do that. Student well-being teams were put in every school in order to look at wraparound services, um, attend to um, uh, attendance of students and engagement of students to provide that that closeness that we need to to really know what is it each student needs our wellness services in general and then we had telehealth options which are we are expanding this year uh, because that's important that students have counseling opportunities and they can be virtual as well so that was another positive learning for us in terms of telehealth Food and nutrition services, we served on the front lines, uh, certainly from 2020 to 2021, over 13 million meals in that first um, year, and that was frontline work. 
Um, and one of the successes from that was also working with our partners from the Montgomery County Food Council to all of the other food council groups in Montgomery County and developing partnerships with them that worked in tandem with not only our staff on the front line providing food, but also food boxes um, from Mana Food and, and um, Women Who Cares and other we, that groups that we would meet with weekly to do this. We have continued those partnerships and, you know, ending uh, food insecurity is definitely a goal. Um, this year, we'll, by the end, we'll have about 18 million meals served. So what we learned this year as we came in was, again, due to, and we are grateful for those federal food waivers and working with MSTE around all the different waivers that it took in order to be able to do this kind of work. Um, it was very successful, and we had more kids even uh, come into schools, you know, looking for, for meals, breakfast, lunch, and um, an added thing that was so beneficial were the snack and supper program. Prior, this is important for you to know, prior to waivers, usually it's a 50% um, free and reduced uh, priced meal um, that that you would have to have in a school before you could serve a uh, snack and supper in this way. Because the waiver was 0%, it allowed us to add, um, you know, snack and supper. And kids were able to take this home and, and really address food insecurity over the weekends. So that was extremely helpful. And uh, we are grateful for that opportunity. And then finally, with uh, provided the Chromebooks for and laptops, we also added Wi-Fi and MiFi uh, for students to really have that equitable internet service, and we still continue to do that. As we entered this year in person, we did not change any of that, and we've increased um, our ability to provide Chromebooks for all students and also for all staff, uh, and that, that was a huge learning, and that is something that we will continue and that we, you know, are so grateful for the funding to be able to use that towards technology. So mitigating the learning loss from the, the pandemic, um, <clears throat> again, like I said earlier, it's not going to be solved in one year. It'll be solved in multiple years. Um, however, what we've learned is how we need to use the funding, and we use it uh, in tandem with our operating budget, in addition to the ESSER funding that, that we've highlighted about the eight different areas that we are using it in. Uh, but those are the broad areas. As we really get down to the root cause uh, of early literacy um, and the significant impact of, of being virtual and then coming back, and then that first end of the year of March 2020, which was difficult to end the year in that way, what we see through our student scores, and remember, um, testing was basically on hold in many aspects end of the year at that, at that original moment. We know that in grades one through five, six and nine, um, you know, those, those are areas that are very much um, areas that we're focused on. Math learning gaps uh, pronounced for grades five and really those transition periods. So we are focusing our programs and our funding in these areas through high dosage tutoring where, where students are getting tutoring multiple times a week. Uh, and also, you know, the viable curriculum, making sure that we've enhanced that professional learning and uh, working with our teachers around um, all the different aspects of first instruction. So those things are critical. We recognize that. We use this assessment for and of learning, and we work collaboratively with, with each other in those ways. The other aspect is focusing on the social, emotional needs and well-being of students and staff. And again, you know, using multiple approaches to this, and we have not completed everything that we want to do. We have more ideas coming into next year. But again, providing um, counseling, you know, increasing counselors, um, providing more social workers, providing more school psychologists. And again, with the labor shortage, uh, that as we talk about historic, they are historic. So you may have 
uh, multiple openings, but you don't always have people to fill those. So then we've actually worked with some innovative approaches of, um, for example, putting in a supervisor of, um, of social workers and then really trying to, to work with the colleges and universities and have people do internships with us and, and increase things in that way to start to build a cadre of staff. And that really requires um, multiple relationships on so many levels and it's that important to us and working with our higher level um, universities. Keeping school buildings open through the surges of COVID was huge this year. And, um, you know, if we had to unfortunately uh, move to virtual for a school, we did that periodically, but we stayed open. Uh, and it was really important for our students uh, and staff to be able to do that. And that's why we put so many different uh, mitigating uh, aspects in for the for COVID itself, and we work hand in hand with our DHHS uh, to ensure that you know we are meeting all of that um, uh, you know mitigating uh, of COVID aspects. And then finally, uh, managing expectations, which uh, I've heard uh, from our our sister county, uh, recognizing a funding cliff. So you know that as we have these funds over the three year period that we are able to bring in and use, you know, performance measures and data to ensure that we move the programs in that need to be in the budget into the operating budget and that we are not caught off guard by that, but we work strictly with our um, stakeholder groups, all stakeholder groups to really um, discuss that. And then we work with our uh, data systems to effectively manage and measure what those are. And we are still learning and doing some of that, but that is a critical component for us, especially over the next two years. And then finally, we talk about, you know, working directly hand in hand with our board. We have um, provided many updates on ESSER funding, in, not only to our board of education, but to our uh, budget advisory team, which, which is all of the stakeholder groups and more of what um, was mentioned earlier. And that is critical uh, to make sure that we, we are working together on that. And that we also have the agility to move uh, budgeting in those funds when we know something is working really well. And if something is not, to not keep doing it, but to then move funds into the programs that are. So it's really critical that we look at that. And those regular meetings with, with community stakeholders happen consistently all the time in multiple uh, groups. And, you know, we do have a COVID advisory committee. Uh, that, that advisory committee has every um, stakeholder from epidemiologist to MC, to our, our MCCPTA, uh, folks and um, staff and all of our different coalitions. So it's a wonderful group that gives us really great suggestions, innovative thinking uh, about the funding and meeting the needs and really uh, addressing current uh, COVID impact. And then finally, uh, our monthly reports, we provide, of course, regularly to the Board of Education, to the County Executive and County Council, summarizing what we do with ESSER funding. We've included that as part of our financial monitoring on a regular basis. Um, and then we continue to monitor student achievement data so that what we talked about earlier is the effectiveness of the ESSER funding and putting it uh, in the most needed areas of mitigating learning loss and for social and emotional well-being. And with that, we will turn it over to you, Comptroller. Thank you. Now, this has been an incredibly robust presentation. If you could get back to us on the financial cliff and how you deal with that, that is of interest. I'm going to, just in the interest of time, defer questioning to you because it's been Dr. Dawson, you and Mr. Riley have been terrific. And I appreciate Ms. Alfonso Windsor uh, being here with you. I think we're just, just in the interest of moving the schedule along. You've been terrific and just as good as Howard, but kind of overlapped. And 
<laughs> so if I thank could, uh, if you want to stay for the State Department of Education, do. But thank you for your presentation. And let me move on and ask Mr. Dayhoff. Thank you. And Ms. Americana and Ms. Uh, Talur to uh, make their presentation. All right. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be here today, Mr. Comptroller. Uh, we're certainly excited to talk about this very important topic. I am Justin Dayhoff. I am not Ari Americaner, uh, unfortunately, but uh, I will be leading the presentation today. At, uh, well, feel, feel free to hit the high points because we're this is a living work group in progress. So, and I'm not suggesting uh, uh, leaving anything out that's important. Uh, I'm just saying it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a subject that um, everybody feels very strongly about. So I'm delighted that you're here and uh, don't be intimidated by your superiors. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. All right. Well, in, in that case, a quick roadmap for uh, what we'd like to go over today. Uh, just a brief overview of COVID funding broadly. We've talked specifically about what that looks like in a couple of our LEAs today, but we'll give you kind of the broader picture across the state. And then in that same way, talk about how that spending has looked across the state, both statewide as well as at the LEA level, what's being spent, how much is being spent, and what's it being spent on. We'll talk about some of the special programs associated with these emergency funding uh, initiatives. We'll talk about the state reserve and set aside funds, which are um, a portion of those funds. And again, we also want to highlight lessons learned and a conversation around fraud prevention and internal controls, because these are, as you've all pointed out, a substantial amount of money very, very fast. And so we want to be clear about the department's work around taking good care of being fiduciary stewards of those resources. Overall today, as my colleagues in the LEAs have highlighted, we have three primary buckets, if you will, of resources that have come through the CARES Act first, SIRSA second, and the American Rescue Plan. In total, that's over uh, near $4 billion. Uh, the, most of that in the most recent of those pieces of legislation, the American Rescue Plan. The first one, the CARES Act, had about $670 million. $422 million of that was pa essentially pass-through funding. Uh, that's the money that we talked about going through the title formula out to the local education agencies. $45.8 million of that was set aside for child care and 157.5 for the school lunch program. We talked about these universal free meals and all the things that are required to get those programs up and running. Those funds are available through September of 2022, so this coming fall. And I'll, I'll mention and tie back to timeline a couple of times throughout the presentation because I think it's important to contextualize this spending with the term of use for these funds. SIRSA, larger pot, $1 billion, $789 million this time for LEAs, same formula mechanism to go out in terms of the pass-through. $35.8 million for emergency assistance for non-public schools. I'll talk specifically about that program when we get later on here. And $128.8 million for child care. The obligation deadline for those funds, September of 2023. Lastly, American Rescue Plan, the biggest of the three pieces of federal legislation, $2.8 billion overall. Two billion of that, again, through the title formula out to the local education agencies. 39.2 million for a second round of that emergency assistance for non-public schools, and $502 million for child care. 193 million of that, to be clear, is actually coming from Health and Human Services, which I'll split out when we get there. The other two, uh, the other 309 million that's a part of that are the child care stabilization grants, which we will also go into. Those, in case you're sensing the trend, obligation deadline, September of 2024. Given that timeline, I think it's helpful to contextualize what is on paper a huge amount of funding with what we are talking about in terms of actual funding out to local education agencies and the term limit, uh, the term life, if you will, of the grant program. So between the CARES funds and the American Rescue Plan funds, we're talking about four and a half years of grant performance period. But when you take four and a half years and you actually look at the per pupil level, right, 
we look at the per pupil level, the amount of funds that we're talking about here actually pale in comparison, and this is just state share of state aid. This excludes all other existing federal programs. This is excluding title funds. This is excluding the local share of state aid, right? But even if, with just looking at state aid, as you can see here, CARES funds, SURSA funds, and ARPA funds are a very, very small portion, both now and in the years ahead, with these funds as, part, as far as the role they play in a total local education agency's operating budget. One thing to note here as well that I highlight is, and speaking to some of the fiscal cliff comments, that these funds do taper, right? Because ARPA funds go through 2024, the previous iterations have obligation deadlines that precede that. However, to the LEA uh, presentations today, to their excellent points about those fiscal cliffs, being strategic, being intentional with the deployment of those resources, both now and over the coming years for this program are essential to both identify and ensure that what's being spent are not reoccurring costs, but also, it still remains important to say that overall, these funds do not constitute a large portion of LEA operating budgets, which is just kind of crazy to think about when you think about the volume of these funds. It just goes to show how much need and how much work is happening at the local and with the local education agencies. So specifically within the buckets that we've talked about today, uh, I'm going to break these up across the three pieces of federal legislation. The CARES Act, we've talked primarily about ESSER funds, elementary and secondary uh, emergency relief. There are three iterations of that, ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and ESSER 3, as you'll see in a second, those correspond to those pieces of federal legislation. Across all of those, with a little bit of nuance as we'll look at in ARP, 90% of those funds are those passed through to LEAs. So those Title I formula funds that are going out to the LEAs, that's 90% of the ESSER funds. The state has a 10% set aside of that program. In addition to that, you have the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund, which has funds for technology. Uh, it has a competitive grant for innovative approaches to connect students and teachers. Uh, supports the broadband initiative, again, getting everybody online, getting people moving to support virtual instruction, particularly early on in the pandemic, as well as the Community College Workforce Initiative. In addition to that, these funds also include the coronavirus relief funds, which are treasury funds, $100 million of which are for technology, and another $100 million of which specifically for tutoring. SIRSA, two main buckets this time. Again, 90%, 10% on the ESSER split in terms of what's going right directly down to the LEAs through those pass-through grants for uh, using the title formula, 10% to the state. We have the GEAR fund once again. This time we have innovative approaches to connecting students and teachers additional funding for that community college workforce initiative. And this is the first time we see the introduction of the emergency assistance to non-public schools. That's about $35.8 million. Lastly, and again, the more nuanced of the three, the American Rescue Plan has 90% uh, again going down to the LEAs, of course. But within that, uh, there's 20% that is required to be spent toward uh, learning loss specifically. The rest of those funds are uh, flexible. The state set aside has some similar delineations here in the American Rescue Plan funds where 5% are for learning loss, 1% for state efforts around after school programming, 1% for state efforts around summer enrichment programming, and 3% for other emergency assistance. In addition to that, the emergency assistance to non-public schools program appears here again in the American Rescue Plan. And then, of course, state and local fiscal relief funds. These are additional U.S. Treasury funds that go towards reopening grants. So thinking back to when these funds were originally approved, we were talking about how do we get kids back in school? How do we get school doors open? How do we make sure that our districts have the funding they need to do that work, as well as to support and attend to trauma, behavioral health, uh, and transitional supplemental instruction and high dosage school day tutoring? So what does that actually mean across the lifespan of this grant in terms of what have we now spent with these funds? Well, as you can see, we are early in the process still in terms of the overall timeline of expected spending for these programs. And I think that's important to highlight because when we see all of these funds going out, there can easily be a narrative around, well, why aren't school districts spending this all? Why aren't they doing it right now? Well, we want districts to do and spend strategically. We want them to do that work intentionally, thoughtfully. And they've articulated today as examples of some of that critical work. So doing so takes time and 
The design of these grant programs allows for that. What we really want to see, if we're seeing spending happen the way that it's intended, is that CARES Act funds are being spent first, that SIRSA funds are being spent second, that American Rescue Plan funds are being spent third. And indeed, when we look at our spend down rates across these three main buckets, we do see that pattern. As of now, or I should say, as of last Friday, when we pulled the most recent data, about 89% of the CARES funds have been spent so far. And then you see that drop off just like you would expect. 32% of SIRSA funds spent so far, 9% of American Rescue Plan funds spent so far. But again, particularly with the American Rescue Plan, we're talking about funds through September of 2024. What are they spending it on? And so I think the stories, the narratives, the presentations you heard today do a great job of illustrating the broader trends that we see in terms of what LEAs are spending these funds on. The biggest bucket to date have been supplies and materials. These are, as you can imagine, these are those devices, the Chromebooks, hotspots, uh, Apple TV devices, as well as instructional materials. Think about expanding classroom libraries for students who can't go or use the main library, instructional materials for home instruction, library books for home instruction. In addition to that, teacher stipends. Here we're talking about stipends for summer school, tutoring, professional development, sub costs, as well as those staff retention bonuses that a lot of the LEAs have chosen to employ with their staff. Same thing on the salary end. So here we're talking about psychologists, the hiring of uh, social workers, counselors, maintenance. Well, one group that we haven't talked about as much today with staffing increases, but we're certainly seeing at the state level, are the increased hiring of positions for maintenance, custodial teams, to clean the buildings, to make sure that they're actually able to open, and for extra lunch and recess monitors to administer this universal meals program. We see that same trend across all three buckets of funding where supplies and materials continue to be the biggest driver. We do see some increases in contractual services. Those are primarily in two groups, instructional services for intervention services, learning management systems to support the virtual learning environments and virtual coursework that LEAs are doing, as well as IT, device management programs for uh, leveraging broadband upgrades, Wi-Fi, hotspot service plans, et cetera. Same thing with American Rescue Plan funds. Again, we're seeing the dollar amount shrink as we look at the spending across the three buckets, but we would expect that. We don't necessarily expect to see LEAs spending down or having as much spending with American Rescue Plan funds as they would otherwise. Important to note that while we do talk about our 24 jurisdictions, the Maryland State Department of Education also administers funding for the Maryland School for the Blind. Maryland School for the Deaf, and the Seed School of Maryland. The Maryland School for the Blind and Maryland School for the Deaf receive public funds for serving students who have IEPs and are not able to be served in a traditional public school setting. And the Seed School is a residential boarding school that serves economically disadvantaged students from across the state. And so I just wanted to highlight here that there are other groups that we work with and to help administer these funds, as you can see here, uh, across uh, the Seed School and the Maryland School for the Deaf and Maryland School for the Blind their spending patterns map to what we would expect as well. Programmatically, two big programs I want to talk about here, the Emergency Assistance for Non-Public Schools Program and uh, Early Childhood and Child Care Spending Associated with Federal COVID Relief. In the SIRSA program, the federal appropriation allowed for $35.8 million in emergency assistance to non-public schools. This is a really interesting and somewhat wonky uh, grant program because it we are not allowed to pass funds to non-public schools as part of this program. We are only allowed to award services and assistance. We cannot pass funds. In fact, we have to retain title and ownership of anything that we procure. And so at the end of this period, we actually have to return any of those devices that are uh, still within warranty, for example, uh, or have not, uh, or is not a consumable, like a PPE uh, or a mask. Um, we received those funds in January 2021. We issued two rounds of funding for that in March and June of 2021. We distributed about $14.2 million in those first two rounds. We did just complete a third round in January to finalize that. We received the remaining requests from our non-public schools. The department now is in the process of going through the procurement to get uh, and find uh, vendors and contractors to administer those services and assistance as per the law. Again, we can't pass the funds to the non-public schools, 
by federal law, we actually have to administer it. And actually, so Mr. Comptroller, uh, in the not too distant future, you'll likely see us a Board of Public Works with some of these requests for uh, non-public schools based on the roll up of what they've requested for this grant program. Yes. <laughs> um, in, in addition to that, if I may, a little teaser trailer. Uh, just last week, the Department of Education, the State Department of Education was awarded its uh, ARP, Emergency Assistance for Non-Public Schools Funding. Uh, we plan to release that application and information about it very, very soon. And so I just kind of wanted to put that out into the universe that that is coming. And we are working to be very clear and intentional with our program design to be reaching out to and continue and expand upon our relationships with the non-public school community to be collaborative and to be transparent in that. And I'm actually going to talk about some of that when I go to lessons learned here in a minute. But Nonetheless, wanted to put the plug because it is another $39.2 million in emergency funding. These schools need it now, and we want to get this out as soon as we can. As to childcare, so I mentioned at the beginning, there were essentially three buckets of funding set aside for childcare across the three different federal uh, pieces of legislation. In the CARES Act, we have $45.8 million uh, towards childcare and the childcare provider community. $31.8 million of that went to cover tuition costs or enrollment costs essentially for uh, these expenses for emergency essential personnel. So this was at the very earliest part of the pandemic where we had uh, families who needed to get to work, who needed to keep stores open, who needed to keep things running, who had no choice, but who also in that same time needed to have care for their children. And so these funds provided costs to cover the enrollment of their children in, in um, childcare program. In addition to that, the other side of that same coin is we had to make sure that we had childcare providers who were open and able to serve and support those families and their children. And so $7.6 million of this went to, uh, as an initial grant down to childcare providers to help reduce capacity so that they could safely and in a healthy environment open their centers, still afford to do so. Uh, and another $6.4 million of that also to the provider community, this money specifically for PPE for the materials and items that they would need in order to actually open and maintain that safe and healthy environment. In the SIRSA, we had 128.8 million, 49.6 of that continued to go towards those emergency personnel and supporting their children and families so that they could continue to serve and help Maryland reopen and reopen safely. $60 million went to provide grants to child care programs to support their recovery as well. And then $19.2 million of that actually went to provide additional funding for the child care scholarship program. As you can imagine, as families uh, were experiencing changes uh, in their own job situations, as the labor market shifted early on, when we weren't necessarily all back at work, where we didn't have the employment rate, uh, unemployment rate we do now, more families were eligible for the child care scholarship program. And so this provided a backfill for that program to make sure that we could continue to support uh, the tuition for those families. Last but of course not least is the remaining 502 million in American Rescue Plan funds. $309 million of that went out through two iterations of the Child Care Stabilization Grant Program. And we certainly learned a lot between the first and second iteration of the Child Care Stabilization Grant. And I'll talk a little bit more deeply about our lessons learned here, but it is worth noting, and I don't think we as a department can say this enough, that we deeply value, respect, and support our child care community. We know that they are critical partners in early child care and education. And we also know that the Federal American Rescue Plan funds couldn't be released into their hands fast enough. We did seek to be one of the first in the country to release stabilization grants, and we implemented an aggressive schedule to meet that goal. MSDE received our appropriation for those funds in August of 2021, and we set to work to get those funds released. However, MSD acknowledges that the department could have done a better job of anticipating that supplemental appropriation from the moment the state became aware of the program in order to build a better, more timely, and collaborative process with our partners. And I'll talk about lessons learned and how we use that with the second round in just a second. The last piece here are those remaining $193 million. The department is in the process of putting those to work right now. Again, these are ARP funds. These go through 2024. So we are working to establish a series of grant programs to support our child care providers and those eligible and a part of the child care development fund with a range of initiatives as we rebuild. I'll go through this part briefly. Uh, I want to be mindful of time, but I think it's worth noting that 
As I mentioned, there are state reserve set-asides. Set uh, and for transparency, I think it's important to articulate what the state is doing with those funds. And so with ESSER 1, the majority of those funds, $20, point, uh, 20 million dollars, uh, 20.7 uh, to be exact, went towards reopening grants, went towards the Maryland Virtual Learning Opportunities and Online Virtual Program Development. So as we talked about with the LEAs, developing, implementing virtual school programs, virtual school curricula. It was important for us as a State Department of Education to also make investments in course design and online professional development for teachers so that we could support this work as it becomes uh, a staple, I think, in many ways of education here in Maryland, particularly because we know that uh, virtual learning is not even or equal. And so being able to invest and learn more about high quality virtual learning is essential. ESSER 2, the biggest piece of that will go to Maryland Leeds, which I'll talk about in just a second. The other buckets of that just consist of several state level department grant programs. We are kickstarting the expert review teams. So the blueprint for Maryland's future requires expert review teams to go out into the schools to be there, to partner, to see what's going on, to make recommendations. So we know that that's coming. We are using some of the state reserve here to kickstart that effort, to get the teams onboarded, to start training, to lay out the processes now for the State Department of Education, but also to make sure we can be a good partner and a transparent partner with regard to how this is gonna work and what this implementation is going to look like for our local education agencies. Continued investments in Maryland virtual learning opportunities, adverse childhood experience grants, which are uh, from the Governor's Office of Youth Crime Control uh, and Prevention, and the Achieving Academic Equity and Excellence for Black Boys Task Force initiatives, and last but not least, mental health response team programs. So this is where the State Department of Education is bringing in essentially counseling, substance abuse support uh, positions so that we can work with and across the LEAs as they also grapple with the trauma of the pandemic, as well as pre-existing need to address social emotional well-being and support our LEAs in that work. Our ESSER three state set aside mirrors that same distribution, uh, again, with Maryland Leeds being uh, the primary driver of that. To that end, I just wanna highlight that Maryland Leeds is a new state grant initiative uh, it's a large one, which is why I want to highlight it here, because we're talking about north of $133 million. These are funds that were set uh, as a state reserve. So these are funds that the state, as I noted, could take back, could use to fund departmental programs, initiatives, and work. Instead, the State Department of Education has chosen to pass those funds out to the local education agencies and to do so to directly support overcoming learning loss and to attend to both existing persisting and increasing achievement and opportunity gaps. We are doing this with a very specific set of seven strategy areas in mind. Grow your own staff, staff support and retention. Again, themes that we've actually heard today. The science of reading, high quality school day tutoring, reimagining the use of time, innovative school models and transforming neighborhoods through excellent community schools. Each strategy contains a number of different focus areas. We provided best practices from the field, lessons learned. We've held uh, collaborative sessions with all of our LEAs for each of these strategy areas. We've held office hours for every LEA, information sessions, strategy information sessions, on-demand calls and support. We recognize that partnership, communication, and collaboration is going to make this work a success and also will make grants work at the department a success going forward. That should be and will be the rule, not the exception when it comes to grant making. Fraud prevention and internal controls. So MSD implements and continues to uh, evolve and refine its standard operating procedures to allow for us to track, monitor fraud, but also avoid creating bottlenecks so that we can continue moving the work forward. So. We are continuing to adhere to current fiscal standard operating procedures to provide sufficient control and quality assurance. Uh, and in fact, we saw some of that come to bear with the Child Care Stabilization Grant and with the EANS program. Uh, we caught a case of uh, fraud, referred it to the OAG False Claims Unit with regard to the Child Care Stabilization Grant, where uh, we had uh, someone applying, essentially trying to uh, get money from uh, what would have been eligible for a private provider. However, because of the internal control process and our population of data and the checks that we ran, uh, we caught that right away and uh, identified that and notified OAG false claims. Similar with EANS. We take that very, very seriously. And based on lessons learned, we also recognize that it is important to be nimble. And so we operate in a continuous cycle of development and improvement so that we have a feedback loop to drive and inform our processes and procedural uh, updates. That includes creating standard expectations for customer service, 
dedicated, uh, we now have a dedicated quality assurance personnel uh, in our MSDE accounting office to do weekly sampling to make sure that as we go each week, the work that we're putting out, the batches that we send over to the comptroller's office uh, are as accurate as we can, make sure that they are. And we also have key and consistent tenants in our grant process, which I'll highlight here in our last slide. One other note that does serve as an additional and an important control is that state and local procurement processes are important mechanisms to ensure and enforce control with public funds. Having purchasing thresholds, having the oversight, the clear committee review process, rubrics, being transparent, having that oversight is essential, particularly with, again, we are stewards of public resources here. Um, oh, okay, that's all right. So. Growth mindset. We are constantly approaching this, as I mentioned, with a nod to improvement. We always want to be improving. So through COVID-19 so far, we've administered about 17 different programs, 426 different grant awards, and more than 16,000 provider payments. We have, still, we have learned an immense amount through that, not the least of which, as I mentioned, is that collaboration. And so I think, for example, about the child care stabilization grants. It is important and essential that we meet with the child care community, the Maryland Family Child Care Association, the Maryland State Family Child Care Association, the SEIU. We've continued to do that. We have standing conversations with those groups now. It is important to understand who our grant programs and who the funding is meant to serve so that we can remove any structural barriers or burdens to getting these funds into the hands of individuals for whom they are intended. And we do so with community feedback to make sure that our processes are our processes are designed with the user, with the applicant, and the intended audience in mind, while at the same time making sure that we are transparent and clear about our department rules because we do have to maintain internal control. We do have to be clear about what is allowable, what is not. We do have to be intentional with our language and messaging and make that consistent so that it is easier to consume. And those are important tenets and major takeaways for us. Also, overall, systems thinking, right? Revising our internal processes along the way to reflect that, maintaining a spirit of collaboration. Uh, you know, a, a shout out to Sandy and uh, all of you at the Comptroller's Office as well, thinking back to the child care stabilization grants. We had the request from child care providers, right, to get those uh, expedited, to get those out earlier. And, you know, you all were great partners in saying, here's what we need, here's what you need to indicate in the batches from us to make sure that those go out. And you know, we really appreciate that support. And that sort of collaborative systems level thinking should be a standard, not an exception. And that's something that we really take forward with this work. Uh, and with that in mind, I appreciate your time. Morgan is set by the State Department of Education, but if you want to say anything else, Ms. Americana, it's really, uh, you know, this presentation is very impressive, and uh, please take my regards back to the, is he the superintendent of education? Give him my yes. best. Yes, thank you. I will. And the superintendent, I think, um, has sent, only because of scheduling conflicts, has sent us here in his stead, but has, has been very involved and has been ensuring that we are, of course, always presenting the best face of the MSDE. And, and I think you see a lot of what, uh, what Justin said here is a constant focus the superintendent has brought to the agency of doing better, of reevaluating what's working, what's been working and not working in the agency before the new administration arrived, and how can we build on what was working well and scrap what wasn't and, and work better and smarter and more efficiently. So we um, we deeply appreciate the collaboration, both from our, our friends in our district offices, from you in the comptroller's office, and, you know, we continue to want to work work together. Excellent presentation. Mr. Talur, do you want to make a brief comment? You've been so patient. Come on up and say something. Don't... Uh... I uh, appreciate the the presentation was the teamwork, as Ari mentioned. Superintendent guided us through the work, and uh, again, we appreciate your support uh, through our uh, BPW work and all the uh, uh, all the other things that we bring forward for your approval. Thank you. Well, with your uh, understanding, we're going to move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much. It's been excellent. And we're now going to hear from Ms. Swerdling, MCEA. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. 
Great presentation. Yeah. Just song. <laughs> <laughs> it's financial planning. I said how to present. That's right. <laughs> oh, I see. Sorry. Clearly, I'm not the tech person. So. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yep. Great. Um, well, I'll just jump right in. Um, thank you all so much for giving us the opportunity. My name is Samantha Zwirling, um, and I'm with the Maryland State Education Association, representing 75,000 educators across the state. Um, we're very honored to be included today. Um, President Bost sends her regrets. She was hoping to be able to make it today. Um, while there has been a lot said across the country, across the state, and in political rhetoric across the spectrum, MSEA has never lost sight of the importance of in-person learning and our commitment to safe uh, learning and working conditions. Our vision for the recovery from the pandemic is student-centered, educator-led, and community-based and transformative. I will speak more about this in sharing our path forward. First, I wanna take a look back quickly, um, in the interest of time, <laughs> and review the last two years and review resources that MSEA has developed and shared and responses from the federal and state governments and local school districts in meeting the needs of our students, staff, and educators. MSEA proactively developed resources for our members throughout the pandemic. We've always prided ourselves in leading in the profession, and that was especially necessary during a time when everything shifted to in-person learning. We provided professional resources for best practices in teaching with technology, as well as a toolkit for self-care during the pandemic. Educators were truly hungry for this information and felt like they couldn't get it in other places. We saw the highest engagement rates ever with our online content that we created around these topics because it was good information and because members were not able to get it in other places. On the advocacy side, we made sure educators were able to ask for the working conditions they needed to to provide the learning conditions necessary for student success. If you'll remember, our working conditions are students' learning conditions, so they're completely intertwined. Um, and if you visit the Safe and Healthy School section of our website, you will see sections dedicated to FAQs and updates for, with health agencies to get this information, once again, out to our members. I noted in the last slide that we were at the forefront of creating expectations that school districts met the standards that were identified by various health organizations to have safe and healthy school buildings. This slide that you'll see here was a screenshot of, our, of the cover of our 10-page health and safety checklist for buildings and workplaces that was developed in conjunction with the Baltimore Teachers Union and the Maryland PTA. This checklist included everything from adequate masking, sanitizers, and other cleaning supplies, um, to ensuring also that worksites were abiding by physical distancing requirements and an evaluation of our HVAC units. I would like to report that we had great partnerships across the state with many administrators in many school buildings to complete this checklist. Um, and some districts even had district-wide commitment. We specifically appreciate the partnership in Cecil County. Where we saw this coordination, educators and students alike were more prepared and felt more supported to return to in-person education. For the most part, in other places, unfortunately, this coordination was not welcome. Most districts did not even want to entertain this level of collaboration and accountability. This was disappointing for us as we wanted to make sure that these were healthy and uh, safe learning environments for all. I started by noting that MSEA's vision for recovery was focused on providing in-person instruction. If you see here, again, our vision for recovery from the pandemic is student-centered, educator-led, community-based, and transformative. You can see here on the slide the elements that we did prioritize when continuing um, as, as we advocated for districts to coordinate with educators and how to spend federal and state dollars related to education recovery. As many others here have mentioned today, you can see towards the top of the list is prioritized prioritizing social and emotional needs and mental health. We'll mention that a little bit later, but I really just wanted to underscore that here because it has been one of the toughest parts of the pandemic and the rush back to normal never appropriately reflected the mental health supports and services that all of our students and many families needed before effectively tackling the academic side to a return to learning. So there were some questions earlier around how we can kind of recover that learning loss, um, but we also really need to take a step back and make sure that everybody is well and that they are able to engage on the academic side. Um, the other point I just want to note here is that the Maryland schools 
um, do have a double financial impact of resources with the passage of the ramp up of the blueprint for Maryland's future, as was just noted by MSDE, um, coupled with the historic funds from the American Rescue Plan. They are both historic in their funding and we are very excited and they represent huge opportunities to not only repair these issues created by the pandemic, but to really go above and beyond and to address these inequities that existed before the pandemic. These funds can and still should be used to increase our investments in community schools and all the other resources that have been mentioned today, including um, retaining our workforce of quality educators. Specific to the American Rescue Plan and various pots of money in the ESSER funds, they were authorized to have a longer tail than most districts had accounted for. The ARP and the ESSER funds created real opportunities to address costs from the last school year, but also they can carry them over across multiple school years, including some through school year 23 and 24. This is critical to realize that there are still opportunities for districts to do more with this funding. And that includes the areas of using these funds on staffing, a priority which is allowable and permissible, um, and uh, permissible expenses related to the ARP dollars. Many school systems are reluctant to hire more staff positions, and I think we've mentioned that before, kind of around the funding cliff, and we're hoping to look for creative solutions on how we can get these folks on board and then make sure that their salaries are sustained. Um, when it comes to um, when we combine the ARP funds with the ongoing and onboarding of the Blueprint funds and Blueprint 2.0, um, funds related to legislation in the past two years, there are immediate opportunities to focus, as others have mentioned, on summer learning, enrichment, but to do a lot more. This slide that you'll see here outlines MSCA's uh, advice to our local affiliates as they sought to engage with the local school systems on creating spending plans related to the blueprint. So really in our local school systems, we're trying to be involved as much as possible in what the plan is moving forward. Of course, we needed to follow the requirements of this funding, but we also want to push districts to do more. You'll see elements here that have already been mentioned, but the ARP funds especially could be spent on several other items uh, on the right side of the slides as well. This covers what we have advocated for so far, and now I'll move um, in the, to the forward on what our successes have been at the district level um, and where there were challenges. So as many mentioned, and I really appreciate hearing from the school systems on how much they valued our educators and really our frontline workers. Um, in our opinion, the biggest area of success was the educators themselves. They were the frontline workers, especially our education support professionals, and has been mentioned a couple of times today, they were the ones out delivering meals in the communities and making sure that families got fed. Um, they were there before the vaccines, before adequate PPE, and with great risk really to themselves. Employees themselves were a success point. Further, as also mentioned, most districts did a really good job in sourcing and providing laptops, hotspots, and other technology. The digital divide was really laid to bear, not just among our students, but including our staff as well, who had trouble sometimes accessing the internet or having the um, appropriate technology. Um, related was the quick turn of curriculum and programs from the in-person learning to online. This was done in partnership with districts and educators. And while we would never want online learning to be a substitute for in-person, it was delivered with as much effectiveness as could have been expected in order to continue learning despite the challenges and rap rapidly changing conditions. Beyond the content of this slide, I just wanted to note a couple of other successes. Um, as um, Dr. Martirado mentioned, um, which seems like a very long time ago. Uh, um, we um, developed um, the school system along with the um, our local there, HCEA. They coordinated directly to develop memoranda of understanding, um, so how our folks were going to work during this time, and that effectively resolved many health and safety concerns um, for the better. Most districts didn't have layoffs, and when they did, they took employees back when the when the students returned. Um, and some uh, districts were proactive throughout, especially in getting PPE in a timely manner and doing contact tracing and the like. Baltimore City and Prince George's um, were mostly ahead of the game in testing to return and prioritizing vaccinations. Um, so as we looked at these successes, we're also looking at some of the challenges. Um, I did start on the success side by praising the workers. And so on the challenging side, we do need to note that many districts um, failed to show empathy to frontline workers or understand how COVID impacted employees and their families. Unfortunately, we had several districts who provided blanket denials for any health accommodations requested at the start of 
the return of school. And that continued with failures to have any standards related to COVID leave. These were really some heart-wrenching stories, hearing from our members crying if they have health issues um, and were still being forced to go back into the buildings. Many districts required employees to take their own personal or sick leave rather than providing administrative COVID leave. Next, there were shortcomings in the commitment to mitigation strategies. Some districts rushed to move back and um, to remove masks or to ignore physical distancing, and others provided one mask or otherwise inadequate or low PPE. In some districts, there was also an unwillingness to really explore long-term solutions like indoor air quality, and I know that's of specific concern to the comptroller, um, and they may have provided one air purifier, but they did not seriously upgrade these HVAC systems, filters, or other improvements, even with approval to utilize ARP funding. The final point on this slide is one that troubles us the most for the time moving forward. Failure to collaborate with educators and communicate with parents led to confusion and a lack of trust. We've had some good examples across the state, um, but some not so good examples. Data was late or incomplete related to school level infection rates, and this must be fixed and including transparent sharing and understanding of how every dime of the ARP funds are spent across the available fiscal years. Some of the failures and challenges were out of control individual districts and more reflected the poor or changing communication um, at the state or federal level. And so that was something that we were all dealing with, the changing in the distribution of vaccines or trying to move back straight to education as usual. Some of the final points to cover this afternoon just relate to where we are now. Um, first, addressing the inequities to meet both academic and emotional needs. I've discussed this through the presentation, but not acknowledging the impact of the pandemic on students and families, especially the, the social and emotional impact is especially concerning. Schools opened to all in person this fall in 2021, and educators and students were supposed to treat it like normal. Um, it wasn't, and it still isn't. Educators report to us constantly that this is their toughest years in their careers, and many are leaving our schools, as you've heard from previous speakers. Our continued response must be student-centered, and we must focus on the support resources and new assistance and opportunities that our students need to bounce back from the effects of the pandemic. Districts need to be unafraid to engage with stakeholders, education and educators and parents. Our collective voices matter and can improve both short-term and long-term outcomes for students. I noted some of the poor communication on health specifics, but there were also some bad communication on virtual learning systems, including the platforms, the type of virtual learning, which technology would be necessary, and how students and parents could interact with educators related to synchronous and asynchronous learning. Simply, changes and recovery in our schools must be led and informed by educators who know us best or who know our students best. And just as each community has been impacted with the pandemic differently, we must recover in um, different ways that are responsive to the challenges of those communities. Finally, many of the health and safety standards should be in place for schools long after the pandemic. This is transformative opportunity to not go back to normal. We should not just demand quality ventilation and learning environments during a pandemic, but that should be the standard all of the time. Working HVAC systems, clean water, available cleaning supplies, these should be baseline expectations. We must fundamentally improve the resources and opportunities are in our schools in every neighborhood in Maryland. Um, so educator voice is sometimes forgotten or ignored um, and even on education issues. So including us um, is very much appreciated. Um, and I send regrets from Cheryl Boast and Sean Johnson um, who wish they could be here today. So thank you. I think that overall there was, um, you know, we, we had some counties who were already on a one-to-one -one, um, technology uh, with their devices um, and others who really had to go a far way to get up to speed. Um, I think overall the technology was... Um, we characterize it as some somewhat on the success side of like getting things out to folks, um, but making sure that all of our, you know, education support professionals who might be, you know, um, trying to provide specialized attention to students, making sure they got the technology they needed. That was sometimes a challenge, but we can um, get back to you with um, some more specifics. Mm 
mm -hmm. Montgomery and Howard were spectacular. So mm -hmm. the question is, yeah. how did everybody else do? And you guys may have a little better read on that. And if you could just give that to us afterwards, uh, that would be terrific. Sure. And then additionally, I noticed you talked about the burnout factor teachers. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if there are any opportunities for pandemic relief to have been better allocated or somehow might have mitigated or ameliorated that sense of exhaustion, yeah, hopelessness, get me out of this profession. I mean, I hope I never hear that uh, from anybody, but particularly from our teachers. Yeah. No, I mean, unfortunately, I'm hearing from like some of our, you know, 20 year veterans are saying, I wouldn't suggest other folks come to be an educator right now. And that's really disheartening, I think, for all of us to hear. Um, you know, we are working on a couple um, uh, of pieces of legislation, but there have been some other places to give folks bonuses to really um, acknowledge the work, the hard work that they've done. That has been um, in some of the memorandum of understanding in various jurisdictions. Um, we're also working on legislation around our education support professionals to give them a bonus, um, especially with the historic surplus we have right now. Those folks who their salaries were not included in the blueprint. So it's something that we also really want to kind of study in the long term. Um, but I think also, you know, a lot of it is not necessarily monetary, but it's also really the communication, as we've mentioned. And, you know, leading to the burnout was, you know, you've done a lesson, and I'm sure um, our BT representative can also speak to this, but you've done a lesson the same way, you know, for five years or something. And then on the drop of a dime, you're asked to switch it um, and completely do your job in a completely different way. Um, and so, you know, we had folks working 16 hours a day trying to, you know, and it's not only just making the lesson plans, it's communicating with the families, um, especially during these times that you might not have seen a student, you know, pop up on your Zoom screen for a long time. It really, you need to make a call and to find out what's going on with the family. And when we have huge class sizes in that way, it not only just affects kind of the, the classroom management or the Zoom classroom management, but it's also like those kinds of check-ins um, with families that I think we're seeing as one of the top um, issues with, uh, with, with learning loss is also just making sure that our students and their families are well um, after this particularly traumatic event. Well, could you also get back to us on this uh, issue of substitute teachers that I'm told are generally older retired teachers, not ones that left the profession, but are simply older, retired, and they often are a tremendous help to current teachers in giving them some relief as substitutes, et cetera. Is that situation still pretty severe also? Yeah, um, the the substitute um, uh, crisis, um, I would put it, um, is really absolutely a problem. Um, we've seen some districts hire permanent subs. Um, I know that Queen Anne's County did that, for example, where they hired, um, I think it was about three people, but just to basically be floating around when we have these absences. Um, and those folks were actually part of our bargaining unit as well. Um, so we were proud of that. But, you know, I think that that's something that a lot of folks need to consider, especially when folks are out on COVID leave and they're out for two weeks or they're having to quarantine you know, it really, it really creates a bad situation um, with the with the staff needs. Um, we did also do a presentation to the Joint Committee on Pensions, kind of talking about rehire provisions um, and basically allowing um, to to help open it up for school districts that if somebody has retired from the profession but sees a need in their community and wants to come back as a permanent substitute, um, that they are able to then be rehired without huge um, impacts to to their benefits. And so it's a that's really a win win. Um, for the school systems and for those educators who want to be involved and who, frankly, most of the times if they're retired, they have the most experience and we want those like master educators back into the classroom to, to be really helping during this crisis time. I happen to be chairman of the board of trustees. I know. Of the <laughs> so that's well one uh, thing. But isn't the answer here, frankly, for some of this situation with our tremendous education system, K through 12, isn't part of the answer just complete vaccinations? and booster shots where required. I mean, isn't there a sense that we're pushing the envelope a little bit with the sub variant that now is apparently worse than Omicron or whatever, but I think that has put a bit of a damper on, on uh, folks that are older mm -hmm. gathering anywhere, much less back in uh, schools. So I'm just wondering what, do you guys have a position on 
vaccine passports or vaccinations being required? Um, we do. Uh, do you mean for educators specifically yeah. or for anybody? Well, I just think anyone in the school environment at some point. Uh, yeah. Once the science is there for all ages and et cetera, that I'm just uh, a little anxious that around the corner lies some other sub variant yeah. that uh, will throw us for a loop. So we don't have a position on um, mandating vaccines for educators, um, but we have been very heartened in working with um, you know local elected officials and state elected officials on making sure that educators are able to be prioritized in the vaccinations. And I think that you know vaccination of our educators, and I can get back to you on this answer, but we had it reported somewhere above ninety percent. Like I mean, I think that most people who are in the buildings um, are doing that unless they have some sort of medical reason for not. Um, but I think, you know, we we have been working really hard to make sure that um, we've also been able to get that information out to our educators, especially at the beginning when nobody really knew like where you could go to get a shot. Um, so we've been really trying to fill that communication gap as well. But but I, I hear your point. <laughs> well, listen, we're going to skip the questions also here. Thank you very much. And let's stay in touch. And just uh, you know, yesterday I was meeting with a big hospital in Montgomery County and the president of the hospital said, you know, we've lost two or three people, two, two or three nurses, some of our best. I said, why'd you lose them? He said, because Philadelphia offered them an eighty, ninety thousand dollar bonus sign in, uh, bonus signing, not a, not their salary, just on top of their salary. So uh, I don't think teachers are necessarily in that situation, but uh, I can so I certainly share with you that other sectors are very, very stressed out in addition to yours and or ours. And uh, hopefully we'll get through this quickly and put the virus behind us and, and uh, be able to move back to normalcy. Absolutely. But thank you for your uh, you. very good testimony. And we're going to move on to Mr. Farrell. If... Uh, Representing the Baltimore Teachers Union, Mr. Farrell. Brilliant, yes. Terrific. Thank you for uh, your patience. Of course. We saved the best for last. That's very kind of you. Yeah. I want to thank the Office of the Comptroller uh, and everyone for having us here. Um, I'm assuming I can just move forward on the slide deck. Great. Um, obviously, there has been a tremendous amount of information shared and I'm going to probably deviate more than anyone from the prepared presentation to make sure that we are not having those overlapping redundancies. And we're going to try and keep this conversation as dynamic as possible so that the Office of the Comptroller can ask appropriate questions. And more importantly, uh, that we as the Baltimore Teachers Union can stay connected with the Office of the Comptroller and other stakeholders to ensure that we are all uh, working uh, to the benefit of both our students and, of course, uh, the members we represent. Um, our mission, you can read more about that, but I'll give you some specs here. Uh, we do represent um, just about 7,000, uh, under 7,200 members. Of those members, 5,700 plus are uh, teachers and our related service providers, school counselors, uh, OT, PT, audiologists, and then we have over 1,400 uh, PSRPs. Um, uh, I'm not gonna talk about myself, but I, what I will say is that the breadth of my experience here, I'm talking on behalf of the rank and file of the teachers of and paraeducators of Baltimore City. I'm not speaking on behalf of Baltimore City Public Schools. Um, I work at a public charter school, Baltimore Leadership School for Young Women. During the summer, I serve uh, in both preparing for the work site and working across various work sites, traditional work sites for our credit recovery and original credit programs for Spanish. Uh, during the school year, I'm also the site-based mentor as per Maryland State Law, COMAR. We provide mentorship support to early career teachers. Um, I was also on the negotiations committee. Uh, I'm understanding of the MOUs that we've negotiated and, of course, the recent contract that we negotiated for teachers. So I'm speaking uh, not from the silo as a charter school teacher, but from somebody who is able to speak to the somewhat the, the vast experiences that our educators are feeling and hopefully represent well our needs um, as a bargaining unit. Um, the grant administration process, I just want to echo some of the other superintendents, it's the flexibility component, okay? So a lot of our charter schools and contract schools have benefited from greater flexibility and autonomy as they should. That's the model for how they're spending their grant money. The traditional schools are incredibly limited on that flexibility. Um, and there needs to be, this, this really needs to be uh, addressed. 
um, how the funds are spent and how traditional schools are able to spend those funds. Um, we're also seeing, and my colleague at MSEA spoke of this, uh, the district is really determining how to spend grants. Um, at Baltimore State Public Schools is determining how to spend grants independently without input from stakeholders. And it's not just the bargaining units of the Baltimore Teachers Union. Uh, it's also our parent advisory groups. Um, it's our PTSA. It's our, it's our student groups. And when you are making those decisions in a vacuum, uh, it is adversely impacting the dynamic needs on the ground at the various work sites uh, where we are. Our successes, I do want to be very clear that one huge success is the funding of uh, credit recovery options for students, particularly at the secondary level. When we came out of the spring of 2020, um, <clears throat> we had a tremendous issue with accreditation. Kids were behind in their credits and it wasn't just learning loss. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of that, but there was also a massive accreditation issue that we were facing. And the money really supported to offer various programs, both virtual learning. I staffed a virtual program summer of 2020. Uh, and uh, then, of course, our after school programs that were operating, the money provided and the amount of willing staff uh, to work those sites and ensure that our students are getting the remediation they need at the primary levels and the accreditation they need at the secondary levels is a real success. And I want to applaud everyone for working for that. Let me just ask that. Yes, because sir. isn't that applicable to every system in the state? Yes, sir. My understanding is that I can only speak to my experience. Uh, I hope that is applicable to every system in, in the state. Uh, I know for us, uh, we ran a pretty bare bones operation when it came to summer programming uh, in previous years and summer of 2020, there was a massive push in hiring to staff more sites to remove the financial barrier. We charge students for those uh, program access to those programs, charter school students and contract school students had to pay a literally we called a retail price. It was over $500 a class, similar to a college course credit to attend summer school. Um, they removed those barriers and that was a tremendous uh, benefit to everyone. This year, the forward thinking process has resulted in the Office of Extended Learning to support teachers by saying, hey, we have buckets of money for you all to pay you to develop revamp curriculum so we can walk into the summer prepared for different models, different delivery models. We might do two summer semesters of three week sessions of three hours a day, and we need you to adjust your programming and curriculum for that. And I think that has been a tremendous success where those funds are being applied at the district so level. The, is it the individual teaching or the virtual teaching with a better curriculum? Great question. The curriculum support is really being teacher driven. Um, by and large, uh, there has not been a lot of support from the district office. This is really being teacher driven. But again, it's that money is being given to teachers to work beyond the contract day throughout April, May and June in the evenings and on the weekends in collaborative teams to produce a higher quality content, whether it's for in-person instruction or whether it's for a virtual program that we're running. We also run morning and evening programs now uh, at different work sites across the city during the summer. We pair with our YouthWorks program under the direction of uh, Mayor Scott, which has been a tremendous help to have those two programs work together to make sure kids are in school in the summer and uh, receiving their education and their credit. That's a highlight. Um, there have been a tremendous amount of challenges. Um, as everyone has been talking about, there is, there is really just this kind of rushed feeling of where, when, when do we, when will this money stop being able to be used and when will it run out? And we're seeing rushed hiring um, that is occurring for a number of reasons. Uh, the rushed hiring may be because we need people in the building right now. Folks talked about monitors, uh, lunchroom monitors, hall monitors, student support staff. And if we cannot find adequate pipelines through the district office, through the Office of Human Capital and through staffing offices, schools who have cash are hiring independently, oftentimes contractors um, paid uh, through in our school as a charter school, we can literally pay people through 1099s and we're bringing them on just to have bodies in the building because of the substitute crisis or whatever it is. And we're seeing from our members perspective, we're seeing rushed hiring, poor training and certainly inadequate onboarding for staff. And how can you, right? It's your first day in the building here. We need you here. We need you doing this work right now. We'll talk to you later. I have five meetings and three crises I'm trying to manage in this moment. So that is a huge challenge that we're facing right now. Some of the failures, um, Baltimore City was one of the uh, few um, districts to provide uh, no hazard pay or retention bonus or even hiring bonus uh, for staff. Um, our PSRPs continue to be incredibly underpaid. We are advocating and working hard to change that. We're hitting a lot of resistance despite the record uh, surpluses and money that is available to them. 
We have a persistent substitute teacher shortage, of course. Um, we still are in a situation where every school does not have a nurse. Uh, we are still in a situation where every student does not have a laptop or a device. And I'll talk more about that uh, in a moment as to what the barriers are that we're seeing as educators to that. Um, and of course, uh, and I wanna reiterate as to make sure I'm not pointing fingers here, nobody could have anticipated what we were walking into in the fall, uh, actually well for the virtual year, of course, but then again in the fall of this year, 2021, as it relates to what our students need, nobody. And we are, um, not to be too pessimistic here, we are rather unequipped to handle the emotional needs uh, of, our, of our student populations, particularly in high needs environments uh, like Baltimore City. Um, so again, I speak on behalf of the Baltimore Teachers Union, not city schools. We have had a massive lack of clarity in how the spending occurs. I shared this with the communications team and we can get this to the comptroller. The first look that we saw as a BTU, kind of a comprehensive look on how uh, budgeting was occurring was this past January on the 18th. Uh, and so we can share those documents with you. When there's a failure to share information in a timely manner with stakeholders and bringing stakeholders in on those conversations, it's very difficult to uh, you know, not have a reactive position when it comes to planning and to be proactive in that planning. So the BTU has fought for transparency with how we use those funds, timely information, how we use those funds, improve communication and engagement, not, with, not just with the bargaining units, but with our community groups uh, and other constituent groups. And we are also asking for disbursement reports and spending audits, not just budgets, okay? You can show us what you wanna do with it, but we would like to see how it's actually being spent. Um, uh, our assessment, um, I'll pick the two kind of key issues here. One is, and this is a, this can also be part of the um, just worker shortage, we can call it that skilled worker shortage, but there's a real failure to effectively staff school sites for the behavioral and emotional needs of students right now. Uh, we have money on the books to have a full social worker at my school. You know, I heard folks say a mental uh, health wellness team are being staffed at school sites. Currently, we have a part-time social worker, a part-time school psychologist. We have one school counselor for over 600 students, and we do not have adequate staff uh, at a minimum level to handle the emotional needs of our school. And we are a uh, independently well-funded charter school in Baltimore City Public Schools. Um, and of course, the other component is that, and actually the Howard County Superintendent spoke to this, when the capacity for a human resource or for a staffing office has not been escalated commensurate with the needs of the hiring crisis that we're in we are seeing huge bottlenecks in finding and hiring qualified candidates and instead the easy out is to contract that out bring in consultants or contractors or temporary staff outside of bargaining units you're paying more for it there is less continuity less oversight for them to handle jobs that we know that uh, working and qualified educators in the state of Maryland or from other states who want to work in the state of Maryland can do and be a part of our bargaining unit. Um, in particular, we're seeing massive bottlenecks in uh, our Office of Certification, for example, um, that is preventing uh, it's a, a, a crisis, honestly, of conditionally certified teachers having access to support in the Office of Certification to make sure that they are doing what they need to do to stay certified, to have teachers who are in the process of renewal to have access to make sure that their renewals and licensure continues to be uh, on, on what, it, what it needs to be to maintain. And then folks are saying, you know what, I'm not gonna put up with a non-responsive Office of Certification or Human Capital Office uh, that is understaffed and overworked, and I will go to a district where I know the workings of the educational kind of bureaucracy component of an LEA is more substantive. And so we lose people every year from Baltimore City Public Schools and from the Baltimore Teachers Union uh, bargaining group because of that lack of capacity uh, that has not been ramped up uh, due to our, our hiring needs. Um, so our recommendations are, uh, we of course think that there should be retention incentives, uh, very much so. This year as a new teacher mentor, uh, part of my job unfortunately is supporting staff with transferring to other districts. Um, I help them understand their rights within our contract and in the school, and we are losing folks from Baltimore City to other counties uh, because of um, different hiring incentives or uh, other bonuses that they can get somewhere else. Um, we are really hoping to ensure funds are used that every student has access to a computer 
Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what are some of the complications with the technology limitations there. We are working uh, tremendously hard and we hope that the comptroller and other agencies will ensure that our PSRPs, our lowest paid workers, uh, our, our essential workers uh, receive improved wages, um, a plan to retain substitute teachers, uh, and we want, uh, and this has been spoken of a tremendous amount, is clarity around the timelines for funds and how that relates to staffing models. We cannot build a massive staffing model that is not sustained and then suffer, um, whether it's uh, a reduction in force or what have you, that would become an even demoralizing blow to an agency that is struggling to staff its schools effectively. And of course, we look forward to working with the comptroller um, with that. Um, I'll stop actually, uh, if there are any questions. What do you, uh, it's excellent what you presented, I think. And it's somewhat depressing at the end to have you appear because everybody else has been very upbeat, but I think you're really- I also want to say, comptroller, I apologize to interrupt, but I have the best job in the world. Okay. Do not feel bad yeah, for me. Yeah. Okay. I'm very but fortunate. What do you attribute the lack of transparency and kind of having all the stakeholders uh, in a more collaborative uh, circumstance, I guess? Is it, is it uh, uh, dislike of, uh, of having that kind of, an op uh, that kind of uh, collaborative effort or is it uh, you know, deliberately thinking that uh, we just don't like uh, collective bargaining or whatever sure. it is that they, they're afraid of or, or meeting with the community groups? What, what is the motivation? Sure. Or what do you hear is the reason? Yes, yes. Well, I'm not gonna say what I hear. What I'll do is I'll assume the best. And what I'll say is that I, I do acknowledge that there is a capacity issue within our district, um, uh, literally a staffing capacity issue. There are few people doing a tremendous amount of work. When you have that, they're in a reactive stance. When you're always in a reactive stance when it comes to planning, it is very hard to come to your bargaining partners and say, we need support in this because you feel you may feel like you're in a defensive position. Um, and that could be a position that has been held. Um, I encourage uh, the Baltimore City Public Schools. I know President Brown of the Baltimore Teachers Union and the rest of the rank and file educators, those of us on the negotiating teams, we are here to support. That is all we want. We want the conditions improved for our students. We want the conditions improved for our teachers. And we want a uh, prescriptive and a visionary model and not just a reactive model. Uh, and we stand by to support um, our partners with uh, in city schools with that. Yeah, I just want to finish with, I mean, it's, it's great what you presented and we're very, I'm very interested in following up with some of this because uh, I think there's room for a lot of improvement. It's not just uh, everything's okay now and we've got the money and we're doing okay. And, you know, Howard and Montgomery are, you know, it's all kind of good news. Well, it's not all good news necessarily. And you know, I just think back uh, several years ago when the legislature mandated that this agency be collectively bargained. It, it was considered to be that back then some kind of punishment for something they were mad at me about. And our directors, several of whom are here today, everybody got very alarmed. They said, oh, well, geez, uh, we're going to let uh, the union into all we have to like collectively bargain. And that's that's going to be a big problem for us. And I said, no, I don't think it is going to be a big problem. I think you're going to find that there's something there. And three or four months later, they came back to me and they said, you know, collective bargaining was one of the best things that ever happened to us because we got into a transparent conversation with our stakeholders in the agency. And we were able to nip problems in the bud. We were able to, you know, make it ourselves a better, stronger agency because of what the legislature thought was something that was going to be disruptive. It wasn't. And same thing here. I mean, you and the school system should be together like this. And uh, I just am concerned that there's some ideological separation that, uh, or just, I don't want to have to worry about that, or I don't like that person. And you end up with these pandemics really graphically exposing exposing why that's not a good that's not a good uh, situation I, I agree 
And to speak to the ideological component, I'll just reference two bills that are currently in the legislative session right now that I've also been supporting with. It's illegal in the state of Maryland to negotiate class size. So House Bill 0890 is something that, again, this is an ideological component. How can we say right now in the situation we're in that it is illegal to negotiate class size? When are we going to move beyond the idea that we are just warehousing children and burning out teachers when we know that evidence-based uh, research says that that cannot continue. So again, House Bill 09, I'm sorry, 0890 on negotiating class sizes. The other component is that Baltimore City does not have an elected school board. The only one in the state uh, is not held accountable um, by a constituency. Uh, and that is uh, Senate Bill 157. We are hoping to have um, to restructure the school board um, in a way to uh, make it more accountable to uh, the community. Uh, that it serves. Um, so I think those are kind of indicators of of some ideological components that we are may not be meshing with. Well, I think you're one of the most exciting presentations we had among many excellent presentations uh, today. And I just want to ask my colleagues if they have any uh, final questions or subjects, uh, Mr. Schaffel. I would just ask a quick question about the computers. You kept you mentioned you were kind of teasing us there. I'd like to hear. Yeah, yeah. Think. So, so when we entered the pandemic, we were probably <clears throat> Baltimore State Public Schools was probably furthest behind uh, in this. In fact, our recent round of negotiations for the recent teacher contract, we had to negotiate for the first time. This is a sad line to negotiate that every teacher in city schools will receive a device because prior to that contract, teachers were not guaranteed a computer. When we hit the pandemic in 2020 of March. Our educators did not have computers. We had to bargain that. When you come from that far back, I know Howard County, Baltimore County in particular, uh, had the one-to-one -one program stemming for, my heavens, I think since 2014, 2015, 20, about there. Uh, when you are this far behind in technological access for students, it is not just playing catch up. You don't have the infrastructure of network systems and school buildings for Wi-Fi. You are literally hardwiring buildings. Your electrical grids are not upgraded enough to run the room for the Wi-Fi room. Uh, you do not have a staffing model at district for the IT support. You do not have a staffing model at the district to even at the contractor level to bring folks into buildings to re-image computers. In my school, we were generously donated over 100 laptops recently. We are on the news. It was in January or February. Those laptops are sitting unused, unable by students to use in our building, even though we have a need because they cannot be re-imaged for two reasons. As a charter school, it is not clear whether we have access to district support staff to re-image our computer. So we're getting some pushback on that. But on the other hand, the district does not have that much capacity in its staffing model of the folks who are qualified to come in and image the computers to make sure that they're network, network compliant. So that's, a, that's an anecdote. Of, of where we are. Well, I like your idea of an elected school board. And I also like, because nothing's more stimulating to elected officials than something like that. The Baltimore Teachers Union agrees. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, this class size is really, I, I think, uh, exposed graphically what may be really wrong with K through 12 right now, that in some areas, we're not able to, you're not able to negotiate class size because um, coupled with everything else, it just, I can't imagine being a successful teacher right now, but go ahead, Sandy. Sorry, real quick question. I mean, it maybe kind of ties in both of the speakers. But in the fall, there was an article that talked about um, about 7% vacancy rate of teachers, but that was obviously before the pandemic. I'm not sure what the pandemic has done in terms of percentage or retention in terms of turnover with these teachers. But as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, if you can't retain these teachers who really, I think at the end of the day, I mean, I'm not in their shoes, but it's about respecting our, our folks who are out in the front lines, right? And so I guess the question I would have is, what do we need to do? I mean, what If you had to boilerplate it and be the soundbite, what do you want the districts to do to, to retain people? Yeah, I'll, I'll defer first to my colleague, and then I'll, I'll share an anecdote for that. Oh, well, quickly, I would just say that at the beginning of the last school year statewide, there were about 2,000 vacancies around the state. Um, and I know 500 of those were in special education. Um, so that's something that we haven't even really talked about. But 
the burnout rate among special educators is through the roof. Um, I think that it's a lot about collaboration and that we can't almost say something around the state. I mean, you know, BTU has one jurisdiction where I don't want to speak for all of our jurisdictions, but it's about having those teachers at the table to have those conversations. So even when we're talking about how we're spending the funds, like we need to have all of those stakeholders there. Um, but I, I, I do think the class size issue, and I appreciate um, that being brought up, that's um, something that we're working on very much so. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's it's the burnout rate of, of people spending all of this time um, and trying to get students up to par. We started the school year with a lot of standardized testing even, um, and that's kind of been mentioned, but that also contributed a lot um, to folks being burnt out when they're trying to cover classes in a bunch of different and places. And, and teach to a test as yeah. well, yeah. Sure, uh, just anecdotally in my building this year, we've been going through the entire year with about four or five full-time vacancies. We have a staff of just under 50 instructional staff. So that's about 10% vacancies co co consistently. We're also missing an administrator. We've been operating at 66% capacity of our administrators. So it was a three administrator team. We had two all year long. So we've been operating at a complete uh, you know, deficit of, of human beings in the building uh, all year long. Um, and that's just an anecdote of what we're facing. One thing that I think could be a very high leverage uh, solution to this, right? We have, and there's and there is actually money in this. There's money increased uh, to support the what we call the the teacher accreditation programs of TFA, um, uh, Baltimore City Teacher Residency, Urban Teachers uh, that support some of the LEAs around the district with recruiting and retaining, kind of on a fast track pipeline for educators. Uh, another high le uh, leverage, I think, thing that could be easily remedied is with our PSR staff around the state. These are folks who have demonstrated that they enjoy working in schools, that they are committed to the education of children. If we were to develop a PSRP to teach your pipeline and actually invest in that pipeline threefold, one, improving the wages of our PSRP staff so that they actually see a future in the career as a student support staff person in schools. Two, provide robust accreditation programs to them to ensure that they are uh, complying with the requirements to become a certified educator, and then three, bringing them on in a uh, co-teacher model or a mentorship model where they are building the skill sets as they're studying and becoming accredited. That is a easy, not an easy way, that is a important way to improve the pipeline outside of these teacher preparation programs, which honestly have very low retention rates. TFA and the other ones are, are very low retention rates beyond year two or three. Um, and that's been a persistent problem with Baltimore City whose sources Honestly, about 20% of our new hires are from uh, those programs, and they don't last. Thank you. Good and I'm sure Mr. Riley's going to ask you with some... ...not have had. How could they... With so much money in the system, how could they not have had... Sure. Uh, uh, ...digital connectivity uh, when it seemed like the other jurisdictions did? Sure. I, I am not prepared to answer that question, and I will not do so. Uh, what I will say is I encourage that question to be submitted uh, to us, and we would love to keep that dialogue open uh, and do as much information sharing as we can uh, from what we know uh, and how we can um, work towards improving the conditions in city schools. Controller, I was going to ask that question, <laughs> but now you're already asking. The question that I wanted to follow up on is, is you had mentioned in your challenges, emergency funding used to hire contractors, and that, that was one of your one of your challenges. Is are you finding that the money, are, are they spending less for those folks than they would pay for teachers and the like? Or are you finding, because there are times with contracts you actually pay more. What are you finding? Yeah, so in our in our negotiated agreements, in our, in our bargaining, uh, in our recent round of contract negotiations, we saw that when it comes to the highly credentialed specialized services to meet our, our FAPE requirements, so our audiologists, speech pathologists, um, occupational therapists, and others, you're we're spending six and seven times uh, what the hourly rate is if they were a staffed uh, hire, okay? We found that. Anecdotally, it's a double-edged sword when it comes to kind of the um, lower credentialed staffers, whether it's custodial staffers, whether it is a health and safety coordinator that just runs our COVID testing, or they kind of sub in that looks like a school nurse, but they're not, it's a health and safety coordinator, or um, the bus monitors, the hall monitors, et cetera. The contracting is a double-edged sword because one, you're paying more 
to the company that's contracting them than you would if the employee was in a bargaining unit and on the books as a city school's employee. And two, that person is receiving a lower wage than they would if they were in our unit. Um, and we have uh, fought very hard with the district to improve our hiring. Why are these contractors filling roles when it could be a PSRP? Why are these contractors filling roles when it could be an audiologist uh, that's paid for and hired by Baltimore City Public Schools? Uh, and this is a constant fight that our union has with the district. Thank you. Uh, yeah, one of the things that I've heard, first, thank you so much, but one of the things I've kind of heard through this is it sounded like each of the you know, the counties, the localities were fighting with each other over IT purchases, uh, cleaning supplies, PPE, staff, all of that. But then, you know, you just mentioned the audiologists, the other things. Is there a role for the state to do more for those things that are ubiquitous across the environment to take that problem away from impacting you? And perhaps we have at the state level can address some of that? And if so, hit me with your 30 second pitch. Great question. I'm not prepared to answer all the things, but I do have a direct ask for our friends at MSDE. <laughs> our certification office, I don't know if you know of its fame, could really use some support. I don't know how that's going to look, but we are desperate to have our certification office and what I will call are the failures. We are negotiating it. We have it in the contract now that they have to respond within a two week period to our members' requests it is a insufferable situation that is resulting in people leaving our district, being non-renewed, not being, being given a list of courses to do to complete their certification requirement, then being turned around and said, whoops, those were the wrong ones that you've already paid for and taken, and you're non-renewed. We need support to address our certification crisis. I will give you my name number and that of our bargaining unit. Uh, we have also provided testimony to MSD about how dire the situation is. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you, Mr. Farrell, for your personal service to the students of transparency and a safer, more academically enriching educational experience. Uh, your testimony was very refreshing on top of all of the other excellent testimony we received today. And I just want to uh, thank you for ending on a I don't want to say optimistic note, but on a note that there's lots of progress to be made that's doable and within reach and affordable and would benefit the entire state. So thank you very much. You did a great job. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I want to thank everyone that joined us. Uh, and obviously my, some of my, several of my division directors here, most valuable people in the organization. Thank you guys for your questions and your attention. And, uh, uh, we'll be announcing the next work group meeting uh, shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.